is the NBA on NBC. The 1996 NBA Finals. It is a beautiful 65 degree day in the Pacific Northwest as you look at the new Key Arena located in downtown Seattle. This capacity crowd of better than 17,000 is hoping their Sonics can get back into the series after losing the first two games on the road. It's the Chicago Bulls and the Seattle Sonics in game three of their best of seven. Final series. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Abbott along with Matt Lucas and Bill Walton. And Bill, the major concern of the Sonics, the fact that their all-star point guard, Gary Payton, just has not done it in games one and two. What do you look for tonight from Payton? Well, Seattle's making this just way too complicated, and because of it, Gary Payton has been a non- offensively late in game two Gary Payton had a terrific look wide open with the game on the line and he barely drew iron the frustration so very evident he's their dominant offensive weapon he carried them through the Western Conference playoffs but in the finals he's been virtually non-existent now the strength of Gary Payton is his competitiveness and the decision not to put Gary the defensive player of the year on Michael Jordan has totally taken Payton out of his game he needs to ride the fans, Marv, their emotional lift, and have a breakout game against Jordan. And Matt, it's clear in the first two games of this series, the Sonics' major emphasis has been in the direction of Michael Jordan. Seattle's strategy has been to double-team Michael Jordan. Easier said than done. He is too quick and too alert. In the post, Jordan knows help is coming. He feels the double-team coming from the top, but escapes with a hard spin to the baseline. No weak side help and no chance. Then with that left tramp on Michael, Percy Hawkins comes to double. Then Gary Payton makes it a triple team. And all field fail to keep him out of the middle. The draw dish to Pippen for one of his eight assists in game two. Now this production would be outstanding for anybody else, but Michael is not satisfied at all. You get the feeling that Michael is due for a monster game before this series is over. Well, they are pumped here in Seattle, ready for game three when we come back. Figures to be a wild scene for the introduction of the starting lineups. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Miller Lite. With a great taste of an ice-cold Miller Lite, life is good. By Toyota and their full line of quality cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. And by MasterCard, it's smart money. We welcome you back to the Key Arena in Seattle. And they are standing and cheering for the Seattle Supersonics, who are 44 and 5 here at home, including the playoffs. And that also includes a victory over the Chicago Bulls last November. We're set for the introduction of the starting lineups. Let's go to the public address and Jim Gracie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Key Arena at Seattle Center for Game 3. Number seven, Tony Kukos. 
crowd is ready, as are our Ahmad Rashad and Hannah Storm. We have reports from both. Let's start with Ahmad. All right, thanks, Mark. First, a, uh, a change in the Chicago Bulls starting lineup. Tony Kukoc will start for Ron Harper, who will not start because of a store left knee, but although he will be available. Now, in game two, Michael Jordan and Gary Payton finally got together for a little on-court conversation. Now, while it was very animated, Michael told me he was still friendly. He said he was welcoming Gary to his home and reminding him that they had no chance of winning there in his house. Now, Gary reciprocated by saying, well, on Sunday, you got to come to our place and things will change. Now, Michael told me that he doesn't like having these kind of conversations on the court. He'd rather let his playing do his talking, and he feels like he struggled the first few games, and now it's time to have one of those statement games. We're more on it. Seattle side of it. Let's go down and still the Sonics priority on defense. Sean Kemp told me today that during their practice yesterday, they worked on defensive adjustments on Dennis Rodman, who killed them with 11 offensive rebounds in game two. He said that during crunch time, instead of rotating off Rodman, they're going to treat him like a shooter. They're going to designate a defender to box him out. That defender's either going to be Sam Perkins, Frank Murkowski, or perhaps even the strong and quick Vincent Askew. It will not, however, be Sean Kemp, creating some potentially strange matchups in certain situations. Kemp said the main thing they emphasized, being a aware of Rodman at all times, even though he may not be a scorer, recognizing that he is a formidable force on offense. Mark? All right, Hannah. And as we saw prior to Game 7 of the Seattle-Utah series, the Sonics have added what can be labeled a new twist in revving up the crowd. ring announcer Michael Buffer making the trip to Seattle but you know he might want to consider switching to the decaf latte <laughs> <laughs> the officials Dick Pavetta Steve Javi and Hugh Evans a reminder that the Sonics and the Bulls are well aware of only two teams in the history of the NBA have been able to come back from an 0-2 deficit Bill's Portland team did it in 1977 over the Philadelphia 76ers. Boston did it in 1969 against the Los Angeles Lakers. Seattle's got to have a great start today to give these fans some hope and keep them cheering. Plus, they have to attack and execute on the offensive end, fight through the fatigue. And the Bulls say they are ready for this emotional onslaught from this crowd. They know the Bulls, that is, cannot ease into this ballgame. Seattle is starting to gain some confidence. It is Urban Johnson and Luke Longley on the opening tip and taken by the Bulls. Tony Kukoc in the starting lineup for Ron Hopper, as Ahmad mentioned, because of the left knee bothering Hopper, but uh, he, he is expected to see action. Jordan going at Hawkins to the fadeaway. Rodman missed the tip, Longley missed. And Peyton came up with the loose ball. So the Sonics to the offense for the first time, and it is Jordan guarding Peyton. Shrimp. Played by Kuko. Backs him in and feeds to Kemp. Rodman with the rebound. Dennis coming off the 20 rebound performance in game two. Longley. Well, Chicago had missed its last 12 shots. That figure dating back to game number two. And Luke Longley scores for the Bulls. Longley knocked it away. And a 
foul is called. Well, Luke Longley got off to such a terrific start in game one. A lot of it was because Irvin Johnson was looking to help other people out. Here, a terrific defensive play by Longley to first strip and then hold his position against Sean Kemp. And a bad pass, so the Sonics give it right back. Sean Kemp jumping in the air to pass. Cardinal sin in basketball. I don't see what Luke Longley did to deserve that foul. He stood totally still. Here is Kuko. Well, Michael Jordan had a little chat with Tony Kukoc during the course of game two and uh, felt that he was a bit uh, on the passive side. We recall he was tentative, held back in taking shots. And again, the ball to the uh, Bulls, a traveling violation. And Tony Kukoc took some big shots in the third quarter, and as he did in game number one, helped to turn things around. Pippen able to save that backdoor pass. Here is Jordan for three. The Bulls continue their terrific ball movement, and I like the fact that Michael Jordan is guarding Gary Payton here. He is not going to let Gary Payton get off. Well, Payton does get him off and hit. What are you saying, Bill? <laughs> Timing. <laughs> and in your face, Walton. You're next. <laughs> Bull seven. And the Sonics, two. And the Bulls able to get off to the quick start. Jordan setting up Longley. Yes. Longley. Talking to the Bulls prior to tonight's game, they're all concerned about the energy lift that this crowd would provide Seattle. Well, they took care of that with the fast start. Well, Chicago looked sluggish and slow of foot in game two. Much, much quicker here to start game three. Sam Perkins getting set to come on. Early substitution. George Carl not giving anybody a chance to play as Jordan will drain this three. You can just see, as Ahmad was pointing out, the focus, the determination, and the fact that he's guarding Gary Payton. Trap got the step. Open shot for Perkins. And it's Rodman with the rebound. George, George Carl yanks Irvin Johnson, who did nothing right or nothing wrong, but in a couple minutes, what do you expect? And then they give Sam Perkins a shot too early. Here comes Shrimp. Hawkins. And Peyton from deep in the corner. Rodman for Jordan. Two on one development. The lead for Kuko. Stopped by Hawkins. And a jump ball. Good play by Percy Hawkins. Hugh Evans called a jump ball, but the outside official, Dick Bavetta, has called a foul. Well, Michael Jordan and uh, Tony Kukoc continue to have a little bit of discussion. I think Michael was disappointed that Tony could not catch and finish on that lob, but he didn't have a steps right. His timing was off, so all he had to do is he made sure he kept possession of the basketball. That was a smart thing. Pippen got the step and puts home the putback. <laughs> it's always funny because a great player. Oh, they're going to call a foul on Rodman in the transition game. Well, not a foul, excuse me. Now they do uh, indicate a foul call. It is on Rodman. And a timeout is taken. With 8.29 remaining in the first quarter, the Bulls with an 11-2 advantage. Although the Bulls won game two on Friday night in Chicago, Michael Jordan was not pleased with his own play or with the play of his teammates, and we talked about that earlier with Michael. Well, I thought we were not uh, preparing ourselves appropriately for the games, mental. Uh, I think Phil and the coaching staff have done a heck of a job in trying to get us prepared for the game uh, strategically, but uh, I think what we have to do is consume all that and then go out there and execute it properly and we got to have the right mental preparation to to do such and I felt we were because at home taking things a little bit for granted a little lightly and uh, you know showed in the first half. 
Well, it has not appeared to be the case here at the start. Gary Payton has come out firing away. You just saw that, that air ball from deep in the right-hand corner. He's taken lots of shots, but those shots have got to go in. Seattle 0 for 3 from behind the line, continuing a disturbing trend as Jordan making that statement game going at who's ever guarding him. Well, whatever the Bulls did yesterday at practice or what they talked about today, they are moving their bodies and moving the ball. The offense is crisp. You mentioned the disturbing trend as Kent was able to get position inside. The disturbing trend from three-point land. They are now eight for 34 from downtown in the series. Well, that's been the focus of Chicago's defense throughout the playoffs against every team. They do not want to give open looks to anybody. Tony Kukoc with a beautiful move. He's hit two of three. And the Bulls are up 15 for another bad pass. The sloppy play by Seattle continues. Assist to turnover ratio. We talked about it at the open. Plus, you get this sense that this is like game three. Chicago at Orlando, that 20-point victory. Chicago came out and played perfect basketball, particularly from the defensive end. Backdoor lead for Longley, who blew the layup. And here's Kemp. Offensive foul. It's a charge on Kemp. Well, Dennis Robbins saw that one coming from about 30 feet away, and he couldn't believe it. Sean Kemp just kept coming and coming and coming. He was standing there waiting forever. The offensive charge. Another turnover. And twice now, Jordan at the offensive end has thrown loud passes. Once to Kukoc, once to Longley. I don't know if they work on those in their native Yugoslavia and in Australia. They need more television sets over there. Bill turning very, very cruel here. Well. That's how you learn the game, Marv, is as a kid watching the games. We may see uh, Michael curb those lob passes the rest of the way. Thrown to Scotty and Rodman. <laughs> Illegal defense was just called for the first time against Seattle. Here's Kukoc for three. Well, Phil Jackson forced to go with Tony Kukoc as the starter because of the knee problem suffered by Ron Hopper. And Kukoc has come out on fire. Three of four, seven points. 18-4, Chicago lead. Shrimp for three. Did not hit the rim. Very poor offensive execution. Did not the kind of start that Seattle needed. Chicago is playing perfect. And here's Pippen drawing the foul. Well, all season long, when Tony Kukoc has had the opportunity to start, he has delivered. In all of his statistics, much, much better. He's always been comfortable as a starter. You can see it in his eyes in this one. I think Seattle came out in this ballgame maybe relying too much on the emotion of the crowd in this building, and they have yet to settle down and just do not look, know where they want to go at the offensive end. Very haphazard. It is now Chicago 19 and Seattle 4. Percy Hawkins trying to put the move on Tony Kukoc. Sean Kemp. And the Sonics are now rushing shots. Hartley with the pick. Oh, beautiful pass. And the Bulls showing their usual superb ball movement. Jordan, the tip by Pippen, what an effort to get to the ball. Mark Chicago's tipping a lot with great positioning, but they bring those down and just try to go up with them again rather than very difficult tips which aren't falling right now. Well, the crowd wanted a foul. Hersey Hawkins challenging Luke Longley. It will be Seattle ball, 17 on the shot clock. Shrimp. I thought the Sonics had a notion early in this game. They wanted to go at Kukoc with strength. They went a couple of times. Detlef didn't take the shot, but there's a mismatch there. They looked at the tape of the game the other day. Tony Kukoc has trouble guarding anybody. Long way. Try to bank it. Kent on the rebound. Hawkins, three on one. Payton for Perkins. Nicely done. And that gets the crowd going. 
The Bulls with a 19-8 lead. Delay of game warning with the uh, Sonics batting the ball away following this. Well, the three-on-one set up by Michael Jordan gambling just over midcourt going for the steal, and Tony Kukoc had to feel like Custer there. <laughs> and the Bulls call for time. 4.50 remaining in the first quarter. Key Arena, where the Bulls have an early lead on the Sonics, 19 to 8, an animated Seattle huddle. Nate McMillan, the injured co-captain of this team, trying to pump up his teammates, saying, you're reacting to the situation. You're thinking too much. You've just got to play and let this game come to you. Sam Perkins telling his teammates, we're rushing, we're forcing shots, and we've got to stop doing that. And then George Carl telling them to take care of things on the defensive end and get into the regular rotation. Start it with the defense. Ahmad? All right, Hannah, the story on Ron Harper, he, he irritated his knee the last couple of days in practice. He came out today in the pregame warm-ups, and it was really bothering him, so he wasn't able to start. He's been in the back riding a bicycle, trying to stretch it out, trying to get ready to play. He's back on the bench now, and appears that he may be able to play. We'll keep you posted, Marv. All right, thanks, Ahmad. Here's Jordan as we resume. Packed by Hawkins. Steve Kerr has come on for the first time. Percy Hawkins picking up the foul, his second. Michael Jordan works that weak side post on the triple post offense so well. He gets the isolation, something that Phil Jackson trying to get him into quickly. The slap on the wrist. You know that Ron Harper's got to be in a tremendous amount of pain because Harper is one of the toughest guys in this league, Marty. He, he plays through injuries so many times. It's got to be kill him and Nate McMillan that they can't be out here. And Hawkins sits down, replaced by Vincent Askew. George Carl is looking for a lift from Askew, who has been getting the minutes off the bench in two games, but only one of five, and he's turned it over five times. Sonic's trying to break. Payton got the roll. And it's the Bulls 21-10 over Seattle. The first time in this series that the Sonics have attacked that full court trap after a free throw, and they get a terrific look and finish. The lead for Jordan, and he misses the layup, but Longley is able to convert. What's going on here? A terrific pass by Rodman. They read that backdoor play perfectly. What mental communication. Think of beauty to watch. Bulls 23, Sonics 10. Shrimp for three. And last touch by Camp. Hannah was right on it. Seattle is confused. They're trying to do too much, trying to think too much. Keep it simple, play basic basketball like the Bulls. And you see the rebounding advantage again for Chicago. We are seeing the best spurt of basketball that the Bulls have shown over the first uh, two games and a quarter. Here's Longley getting inside. Nice move by Luke Longley, and the Bulls now lead 25 to 10. It has not been impressive for the Bulls, although they did win the first two games. Steve Kerr said the other day the Bulls have actually played only three and a half good games in the entire playoffs. It's nice that they set such a high standard for themselves. That's one of the reasons they've dominated basketball this year. Kemp able to save it. Shot clock is rolled down at three. Down to one. And it is a 24-second violation. What a defensive sequence by the Bulls. But Seattle's forwards on the offensive end are, are really giving them nothing. These are their creative forces, Kemp and Detler Shrimp. These guys are jumping in the air to throw wild passes, not making good, strong, authoritative moves to the hoop. Three minutes to go in this first quarter. Here's Kerr from way downtown. His shooting has been off in this series. Well, Steve has been unable to make him from the new three-point line. He's moved further back. Feels he can maybe get his touch again. Perkins off the head fake. Sonics 12. Longley unable to control Perkins. Perkins is left-handed. 
Jordan. Yes. Nine points for Jordan. He's at three of seven. Not seen many stops at the uh, the other end of the court as Chicago goes to the offense. They have been scoring at will in this first quarter. That's a classic example of, of just what great offense does to a very good defense, one of the top-rated defenses in the NBA, Seattle, this year. And a three for Jordan. That gives him 12. Bulls lead 30 to 12. Now, the Chicago Bulls respect the defense of Seattle. I think that's why they came out. They knew they would be tough in this building. That's why they have come out. They spaced the floor beautifully and passing the ball and making their shots do it, too. The steal by Jordan leading to the breakaway by Pippen. Oh, the Bulls are just eating up the Sonics in this opening quarter with a minute 35 remaining. It's the Bulls 32 and the Sonics 12, 22nd timeout called by Seattle. Michael Jordan hits the three-point shot and then comes right back on the defensive end on the advancement of Seattle's offensive possession, the look-away pass, and Scotty off to the races. And you have to wonder if Chicago was just toying with Seattle back in the Windy City. Well, a 20-point lead for the Chicago Bulls with a minute and 35 remaining in this first quarter. The largest lead at the end of the first quarter in the history of the NBA Finals. 20-point lead by the Lakers over the New York Knicks back May 6, 1970. That was game number six of that best of seven, followed up by the long-remembered Willis Reed appearance in game seven back in Madison Square Garden, leading to the uh, victory in the series by the Knicks over the Lakers. Pippen on a lead for Rodman. And the onslaught continues. And no excuse for that on the part of Seattle. Just very poor transition defense. Have plenty of time to get back and cover up in the lane. We're approaching one minute left in this first quarter. Trent. Oh, and reverse. And cover. And the ball's now lead 34-14. Ron Hoffer is on the floor for the first time. Did not start because of the, the knee problem. Michael Jordan sitting out here in the final minute and a half of the first quarter. So Hoffer and Kerr at the guards. Kukoc, Pippen and Rodman up front. Kukoc forcing. And Peyton in the open floor. Hit from behind by Kukoc. Well, every opportunity that the Bulls get to run, they will, whether it's a steal, whether it's a rebound. This is the outlet pass of Scotty Pippen getting out, getting the lead pass from Kerr, and attacking the defense, and just Dennis Rodman sneaking in on that right side, even though Pippen jumped in the air plenty of time to find the open man Rodman. The Bulls get out of their offense when Jordan goes to the bench. Scotty's got to take a more assertive role. Now Perkins able to save that pass, nearly thrown away by Askew and a foul. Committed by Kukoc, his second. Plus, when Luke Longley was in, he did a good job staying in front of that basket, forcing the Sonics to the perimeter game. Longley goes to the bench, and Sonics having some success at the hoop. Sam Perkins at the line with the balls over the limit. Sam coming off a 5-for-10 shooting performance, 13 points in game two. Now Jordan returns. Hopper sits down. Don't know if Harper's going to be able to give much to that. He looked a little gimpy out there, Marv. Sixteen seconds remaining in the quarter. 18-point Chicago lead. The ball's holding for a final shot. Down to five. Jordan putting moves on Askew. One second remaining. Well, Askew played him well. So the Chicago Bulls in command after one. They are up 34-16. Tony Kukoc providing a lift in the starting lineup at 3 of 5, 7 points, 12 for Michael Jordan. We'll be back in Seattle right after these messages.
This is the NBA on NBC. The 1996 NBA Finals. Well, the Bulls with a 34-16 lead on the Sonics as we head to the second quarter here in Seattle. Eddie Fetter of Pearl Jam on hand. He was at the two games in Chicago, a native of Seattle, although has ties to Dennis Rodman. And there's Kenny G, who did a terrific job with the anthem prior to the game. Although Bill uh, Matt was disappointed. He, uh, he thought Kenny G would sing the anthem. <laughs> a little confused about it. Kenny is a regular Sonic fan. Played the national anthem the opening night here, but the Sonics are shooting themselves in the foot here. They got six turnovers. They're 0 for 6 from behind the line. They've given up six offensive rebounds. They're down 18 points. Well, George Carl was telling us on Showtime that uh, he thinks it's mental, not physical. It may be a bit of both here in the uh, in the first half. Well, the Bulls have brought their A game in that first quarter. And it's now Chicago 34 and Seattle 18. Bill Wennington on the floor for the first time. Jordan with Kippen, Kukoc, Wennington, and Rodman. Got clock at six. Jordan got the step, rejected by Kemp. Sean Kemp came over and made the block. Jordan is very frustrated. Just two seconds on the shot clock. He is playing so well. His teammates, Kukos, not keeping up with Michael Jordan today. And he's frustrated about it. All right, Jordan. Will it count? No. 24 seconds. Well, I think Bivetta and the trail official having a look at this, but so difficult to hear. You see the shot clock on the left part of your screen. Very, very close. Michael Jordan in his <laughs> inner ear, he felt it was good. But, Bill, you have gotten the, the matchup that you have wanted so far in this series. Peyton and Jordan finally matched up. And that was the first turnover committed by, by the Bulls. Foul on Weddington. I just don't understand why Seattle waits for game three to get it going. Or until you get behind by 16. Absolutely. Peyton, Askew, Hawkins, Perkins, and Kemp on the floor for George Carl. Here's Peyton for three. They cannot hit the three-point shot. They have missed their last 14 from three-point range. And that one didn't have a chance. It didn't look good at all. Wellington run into by Askew. And right away now, Michael realized that he is being defended by Payton. He is just going to run to the low blocks on either side and try to be the post man in this triangle offense and try to get inside as much as possible. Not that Payton is much smaller, but Jordan certainly stronger than Gary Payton inside. And you recall they got involved in a heated exchange during the fourth quarter on Friday night. Jordan said it was just conversation. He said he can't get in my head. And I'm uh, pretty sure he's not going to let me get in his head. Jordan said to this point, that is a standoff. Good coach. Just watching Jordan and getting in his in up close to his face and seeing the defensive effort. Askew with the floor. And the Sonic showing some signs. They are now down by 14. But Jordan's presence just so inspirational. And the crowd very much back into it. Hugh Evans calls the foul on Gary Payton. 8-0-1 by Seattle. And right away, Michael wanting to take that weak side post position against Peyton, and Peyton battles hard. This is why he is the defensive player of the year, and really, that was not a foul. That was just good, hard, tough post defense. If that were two big men, they wouldn't have blown the whistle. And yeah, the battle continues between Jordan and Peyton. Jordan turned it over, picked off by Hawkins, who was blocked by Pippen for the foul. 
Scotty Pippen. And Michael is forcing things a little bit right now. He wants to take it to Gary Payton in every opportunity. Timeout taken by Phil Jackson. 2.04 gone by in the second. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Plymouth. One clever idea after another. That's Plymouth. By Microsoft. Where do you want to go today? And by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. We welcome you back to the Pacific Northwest. As you look at Dennis Rodman, who a moment ago was hit with a technical foul for what is termed unsportsmanlike conduct. <laughs> well, M Michael, I, mean, I should say Dennis Rodman giving the two-hand disgusted wave towards referee Steve Javi, and that is automatic. We saw it in game one with uh, Joe Crawford. As soon as you put those two hands up and wave in that fashion, you don't even have to say anything. That's an automatic technical. And Dennis is trying to explain to Coach Phil Jackson I didn't do anything, coach. Absolutely nothing. There's no way you can show up the referee. Dennis clearly at fault there. Percy Hawkins converting on the technical. Once again, Dennis Rodman called for an early technical foul. Back in uh, game one, that led to the uh, Frank Burkowski Dennis Rodman controversy. And Burkowski has not been a factor since. George Carl refused to give him a chance to play. And Burkowski can be a positive contributor for this Sonic team. Well, the Bulls have led by as many as 22. Payton with the back end move on Randy Brown, who just came on following the timeout. Brown extending the knee and his call for the foul. So a 9 0 run by the Sonics. A good move by Phil Jackson, though, to get Brown in there to watch Peyton for a while. I think he sensed that Michael Jordan is trying to do too many different things once Michael will settle down a little bit. Here's the double on Kemp. Jumping to pass. And Askew, as a result, lost it. A host of turnovers in this first half by Seattle. The Bulls have missed their last five field goal attempts. Pippen getting the good position. Got clock at six. Scotty Pippen was hammered inside. The non-call led to the scramble play on the perimeter and the confusion for the Bulls. Peyton again working on Brown. They lost his balance. Peyton. Oh, what a sequence for Gary Payton. Well, Gary Payton operates so well when he gets the ball down low on the left side. That's one of the things that Ron Harper has kept him from doing it. Brown puts good pressure on, but he should let him get that deep. But look at the size differential that, that Randy Brown gives up. Weddington going blast. And now Steve Gavi with a call. Maybe a double foul here. Yes, it is. A double. It's on Kemp. And Robin. And Robin getting a break there. And Sean Kemp can't believe anything was called against him. He was just boxing out, a push and a shove from Dennis Robin. And very quickly, Michael Jordan got right into the face of Dennis Robin and told him, cool it right now. You've already got the one technical, and this was very close here. On the weak side, Rodman and Kemp battling for position. And you see there, Rodman clearly the instigator. Kemp just trying to hold his arm up and box out Robin. And now Sean Kemp has two fouls, but he was not involved in that play at all. And he has to go to the bench. And Rodman also sits down after collecting his second. Shrimp for Askew. And it's a charge. Offensive foul. Vincent Askew trying to make things happen. His offense off, although he's not noted as an offensive player, but with the injury suffered by Nate McMillan, they're looking for a bit more from Askew. Or Askew is pump faking that three-point shot. He hadn't even taken one. That pump fake doesn't work. Make another swing pass rather than try to create off an ineffective pump fake as crew coaches in the lineup. Well, 
Turnovers a problem for Seattle all season long. Yes, they force them, but they kick it away too many times. Nine turnovers already in this first half. Shot clock at five. Brown for three. Randy Brown, who does not think shot first, able to hit from three-point land. So much of that is coaching, bringing the guys off the bench like Kerr and Bushler. Yeah, they make so much of the Chicago bench, but really, these are all guys who nobody really wanted. Much the way Orlando has a bench that nobody wanted, but Chicago, through Phil Jackson, they just have such great ball movement. Everybody willing to give it up because they know because of Jordan's leadership, he'll give it right back. Randy Brown on the last foul. How about Brown during the regular season? One for 11 from downtown and just hit over three here in the NBA Finals. 16-point Chicago lead. Shot clock out of five. Perkins. Perkins on the rebound. And the officials check with each other the ruling last touch by Brown of the Bulls. Bill Jackson up the sideline arguing for a double dribble on Sam Perkins, but it was not an intentional dribble, the first bobble of the ball. George Carl wants a timeout. 7.09 remaining in this first half. The Bulls 39, the Sonics 23. This is not a good stat line for the Sonics. This includes tonight in the first half. They have picked up 41 assists, a low number, and they've turned it over 43 times. Well, it all speaks to their execution on offense. Not enough ball movement, not good passing, and consequently, you're not going to shoot the ball very well. But the Sonics have had problems with turning the ball over all season long. That man, Sean Kemp, averaging four turnovers a game throughout the season. He's got three tonight, as does Askew. Kemp averaging over 30 points a game in the series. He's got two points this afternoon. Seattle had only 10 assists in the game on Friday night. Peyton, Peyton able to chase it down. Shrepp eluding Bushler, who just came out. That left Shrepp with his third field goal. He has six points. And the Bulls now lead 39-25. Chicago is led by as many as 22 they came storming out to quiet this crowd the crowd getting back into it with a good play by the sonics who are able to run off nine straight points Coop coach will go to the line as he was hit oh, this is just another example of what i would call careless defense yes it's the way seattle plays but let's watch Tre uh, that left shrimp first having to shake off the challenge shot there got a good look at the basket as Dettler Shrepp is going to have to do a lot more of that. But the other end, ball goes inside to Luke Longley. And Gary Payton just gambles and comes over in double teams. And then leaves his other defenders out of sorts underneath the basket. You just can't do that. Matt, Chicago is the best offensive team in basketball this year by the numbers. But they stick with their patterns. You, you always sense, well, we know this is coming because they're going to post up a guy. They're going to flash off. Seattle is too much of a scramble. Off the pressure defense, a foul on Bushler. Bulls over the foul limit. Six and a half minutes remaining in this first half. You see Frank Burkowski getting set to uh, check in. Dennis Rodman has been sitting it out, as has Sean Kemp after they uh, picked up the double foul. Kemp is now back on the floor. Sean Kemp very quiet in this first half. One of three from the field. Bukowski well, checks in, and here's his good friend, Dennis Rodman, getting set to return. Now the courage of Phil Jackson right now. But Dennis Rodman already won technical, a couple of personal fouls. A volatile situation could develop, but I think Phil trying to show Dennis that he trusts him. Bulls 41, and the Sonics 27. Coaches have to show trust in their players. That's why Phil Jackson is the coach of the year and the best coach in the NBA today. 
Hill, are you uh, on the take here? Not that I would disagree with, with that, but you would push for Phil, right? Uh, look, look what he does with this team. I mean, Luke Longley, nobody wanted him. Steve Kerr, nobody wanted him. R Randy Brown, Bushler. He's taken all these guys. They learn from Jordan. They learn from Pippen. And they get an unbelievable team here that thinks basketball as a unit. Oh, I'm not disputing it, but I, I think this is about the fifth time it's been mentioned. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't say that nobody wanted the players that you mentioned. It's just that they found their niche with this particular ball club. Luke Longley with a nice move as uh, Rodman and Burkowski became entangled. Luke Longley with a terrific start. Five of eight from the field. Ten points. Lead by 16. Shrep for three. And Rodman with the rebound. So the Sonics 0 for the last 15 from three point range. Jordan got caught. Oh, Michael Jordan with a couple of miscues here in the first half. Oh, a nice pass from Payton. That left Shrep with 10. Chicago's lead is now 14. More and more plays like that will get Seattle right back into this game and into this series. Kerr, yes. Steve Kerr with his first field goal coming into today. One of 11 from the field, the first two games of the series. And coming off a uh, superb shooting performance against Orlando. That left Shrimp, a different player here in the first half. Well, he's manhandling Judd Bushler right now in the low post, but that left Shrimp can do that to various sizes and shapes of players. Timeout taken by the Bulls, 4.45 remaining. In the first half, the Bulls by 14. As we return to Key Arena in Seattle, here's what's coming up on the Prudential Halftime Report. We'll bring you more of Jim Gray's interview with Dennis Rodman, one of the best rebounders in history. He won his fifth consecutive rebounding title this season. We'll also get the thoughts of Julius Irving and Peter Bessie on the first half of the Bulls and Sonics. Chicago has been great so far, building a 14-point lead. Let's go back courtside to rejoin Marv Albert, Matt Dukas, and Bill Walton. Mark. Thank you, Bob. And the Bulls have been able to do it despite the fact that Michael Jordan only four of 12 from the field and he has missed his last four. He's also turned it over uncharacteristically on two occasions. They double up on Jordan. Two coach. And back comes Peyton. And Shrimp took his eye off the pass looking for the shot. Mark, Gary Payton has a, a, has a careless habit of giving up that ball in transition on the flow in the mid-court area. I think that's a bad mistake. Pippen is blocked, and then strip. Burkowski, but with the strip, but threw it away. Now single coverage with Hawkins on Jordan, who goes right at him, and is fouled. And you mentioned Jordan's performance, Mark, but, but it was his start that set the tempo, that got him out to that 20-point lead, and they've just been sort of hanging on right now, just sort of trying to keep the status quo, maybe get to halftime with a, with a good solid lead, and then come out in the third and just really hammer down again. That seems to be Michael Jordan and the Bulls' approach today. Well, Michael had his free throw shooting problems in game two, just 10 for 16. And he is well aware that every time that he drives to the basket, there is going to be some kind of a hard foul. Talking to him before the game, I asked if it was borderline of some of these maybe flagrant fouls. He said, no. He said, they are clean, hard fouls, and we expect them. we got to be ready to take them. We saw John Sally check in. So Sally was lonely. Kuko jump front, Pippen and Jordan in the backcourt. 16 point Chicago lead. Sean Kemp, who has been quiet, facing the double team. Here is Shrimp. Burkowski. And knocked out of bounds. And a foul call on Burkowski. Sonics are over the limit as 
Spurkowski is committing his second personal. A wild offensive sequence for Seattle where they're really just throwing it up there. They need to get better shots. With you. you drive in there, you draw the defense, and then you kick out to somebody who's standing at the foul line or the three-point line. Spurkowski unable to get it going. And Spurkowski sitting down. Jordan now with 15 points. The Bulls 48 and the Sonics 31. And this game three of the best of seven NBA final series. Game four here in Seattle Wednesday night. Nine o'clock start Eastern time. Six out on the West Coast. Three and a half remaining in the first half. Sally on Perkins. Kemp around Longley and fouled by Longley. Well, Sean Kemp is so confident when he goes into a one-on-one -on -one situation against Luke Longley, whether it's close to the basket, whether it's on the perimeter. He knows he can put the ball on the deck and get in there and create some contact from Luke Longley, and that was just a careless foul by Luke as he reached in. Sean Kemp with just one field goal, one of three at the line. Kemp has been the offense for the uh, Sonics first two games, 29 points and in game two, he had 32 points in game one. Longley sitting down after picking up his second foul, leaves with 10 points. So the Bulls with a 49-33 lead. Marv Rodman's been in and out of the lineup so much tonight, almost like on a on a yo-yo there, impossible for him to get a rhythm for the ball on the, on the boards. Who coach able to save it? Pippen resets, shot clock down to four. And it will be Seattle back in possession. Uh, if you're George Carl, you're just hoping in these last three minutes that you can close this gap, get us around 10 or 12, so you have something positive to talk about during halftime. Back comes Kuko. Again, it's Peyton on Jordan. Sally, played by Kemp. Jordan. Yes, nicely done on the setup from Kuko. Mark, they just keep moving all the time. When one guy has the ball, they're not standing watching. And there's nothing passive about Tony Kuko here in the first half. Sean Kemp. Six points now for Kemp. The ball's 51. The Sonics 35. Mark, Tony's one of those guys who responds to the challenge. A very competitive guy, even though a quiet personality. Harper out. He knows it's his day. And Michael Jordan picking it up. He has 20 points. The Bulls by 18. Well, Tony knows he's playing with a lot of fellas out there who have a lot of championship rings, and he's got a few European championships of his own. So that's a that's a good lineup. Offensive foul. That's three on Kemp. John Kemp working for low post position just nails John Sally with an elbow in the head. The referee's right on top of it. Digging in deep there, Sean Kemp leans right in. And that initial elbow from the left side right to John Sally, who, who does know how to respond once that whistle blows. And Kemp sits down. David Wingate comes on for the first time. Jordan being guarded by Wingate. Shoots over. Yes. Oh, Michael is on fire now. 23 for Jordan. Three-pointer for Michael Jordan. And it is now a 21-point lead for the Bulls. They have led by as many as 22. Foul was called on Sally. It wasn't too long ago we were saying, Michael Jordan, maybe he's trying to do a little too much. Well, hey, he's doing it. <laughs> Inside, outside, everywhere, as he is really feeling it right now like nobody can cover him. When we were talking to him before the game today, you could just feel that intensity just coming out, oozing out, if you will. This is a very special person. But of most significance, Michael telling us that he would like to play golf tomorrow, and the only way he could 
do it under his terms would be if the Bulls win today. And Phil uh, Jackson gives the club the day off from practice. And uh, we said that might be your greatest motivation, and he did not disagree. Well, even if they don't have uh, uh, any time off from practice, the sun stays up so long in this town. 9:15 last night, it was still shining. Matt uh, looking out the window with the uh, with the watch in his hand. <laughs> I wrote it in my diary. That must live in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> Bulls with a 56-37 lead. Jordan. Yes. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan with 25. He is now 8 for 16. And the Bulls lead 58-37. Marvin, it all comes down to style for the Bulls right now. Everything coming off passing. The few occasions it does break down a little bit. Jordan always there to bail him out. Now it's called. Sally took down uh, Perkins. Michael Jordan has hit his last four shots. 25 points in this first half. I was saying how the Sonics would like to go into halftime, maybe down 10 or 12. Well, it's gone the other way. Now to 21. And with all the ideas to double-team Michael Jordan, probably the best time would have been to do it these last couple of minutes. Now, yes, he's out on the perimeter, and you don't want to run crazy double-teaming. When he, but when he is this hot, you must run at him and get the ball out of his hands. Sam Perkins, four for four at the line. But I don't think the problem has been so much on the defensive end for Seattle. I mean, nobody's really going to stop Michael Jordan. The problem is offense. They got 37 points playing at home. They come out in the opening quarter, stink it up. They get 16 points. And Jordan is headed back to the line, fouled by by Wingate. Well, Bill, the Sonics are now 14 of, of 32, shooting 43 percent. The Bulls are at 51 percent shooting, 22 out of 43. All the talk has been about the big start, the home crowd. They come on flat, Bulls playing perfect, and now the crowd is sitting on their hands here in a, a half-hearted attempt to distract Michael with some deflated balloons behind the basket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really bothersome. <laughs> A 22nd timeout has been called by Seattle. Those said 12 turnovers by Seattle, many of them forced by the Chicago Bulls defense, something they do very, very well. Some of those turnovers of the careless variety. We are down to 50 seconds remaining in this first half, and the Bulls now lead 59-38 as they look to make it 3-0 in this best of seven. The Sonics will need a dramatic turnaround in the second half, Michael Jordan with 26 points. He has hit on 8 of 16 from the field. He has converted his last four shots. Incidentally, the, the record for the NBA Finals, most points in a Finals half, 35, which is held by, yes, uh, Michael Jordan. Game one against Portland in, in 92. Another look at uh, the move by Jordan a moment ago that led to the foul called on Wingate. Well, David Wingate and Michael have had their confrontation so far in the two and a half games of this series. That was just a fly pattern after the made free throw, but uh, David Wingate maybe has some long fingernails there. He got the neck and chin of Michael, the side of the arm. Michael was checking all over the place to see where he was cut on this play. Michael would have been a pretty darn good wide receiver. It's the Bulls 60, the Sonics 38. And Matt, don't encourage him. The last guy that did that, he wouldn't play baseball for a while. Perkins. And by Sally. Lead pass for Shrek waved off for an illegal defense call. Uh, Judd Bushler who was on the weak side trying to help out as that double team came about. He was just in no man's land trying to zone up and protect and got caught. That was the first illegal defense against Chicago. Seattle was hit with one earlier. Now a half minute left in this opening half. Aiden wanted to use the pick, but uh, Perkins was moving with him. Here's Wingate. Rebound by Pippen. And the Bulls will hold for a final shot of this first half as we come up on 10 
seconds to go. Here's Pippen. Yes, and it counts. Well, a symbolic finisher to a first half that has been just splendid for the Chicago Bulls. It has been a clinic for Chicago. Every aspect, Jordan, Pippen, the big guys are playing their game. Dennis Rodman celebrating. And what is it? And refereeing. Yes. <laughs> Something different. Well, they did miss a free throw. Final seconds of the half. Biggest lead of the night. Enjoyed by Chicago. Bushley with the steal. A 24-point lead for the Bulls, who are seeking to go three up in this best of seven. Michael Jordan leading the way, 27 points, 15 in the second quarter. We'll be back in a moment with Bob Costas and the Prudential Halftime Report. This is the Prudential Halftime Report, brought to you by Prudential. Live well, make a plan, be your own rock. Halftime of Game 3 at Key Arena with the Bulls leading the Sonics 62-38. to 38. Chicago led by 22 late in the first quarter. Seattle rallied, cut it in half, got to within 11, but now at the half they're down by 24. And Michael Jordan, who scored 28 in Game 1 and 29 in Game 2, already has 27 in this first half. Bob Costas back along with Dr. J and Peter Bessie, and we'll talk about the first half in our next segment. But first, to Dennis Rodman once again. He had a quiet first half on the backboards, grabbing five rebounds, and he scored just two points. He also picked up a technical foul in the second quarter for unsportsmanlike conduct, but he was the key figure in game two with 20 rebounds. And after that game, he spoke with Jim Gray. Aside from all of the tattoos and the earrings and so forth, are you a basketball purist? Do you care a lot about the game? I care a lot about the game, you know. I get a lot of people saying, well, Dennis is, is making a mockery out of the NBA. It's not all about making a mockery out of the NBA. It's all about being an individual that's playing in this game. You know, I don't need to make a mockery because this business is too big for one individual to try to bring it down. What made you decide to show all of this individualism? You were a very successful player in Detroit yet you didn't seem to get much of the limelight or the credit. Was the rest of this simply designed as a marketing aspect, and do you view this almost like all-star wrestling? Now, this is not marketing. You don't market stuff like this. People in society don't like what I have, but the only reason why they liked it is because of who I am. I'm a basketball player. Can you explain the phenomenon that you have become, people stopping on the freeway with the billboard of your hair, uh, kids emulating you, changing the color of their hair. Can you explain why you have become so popular? I think that people see it as, as an entertainment. They see someone out there and say, wow, that's the guy with the red hair, that's the guy with the multicolored hair. The chameleon, that's gonna be my new name, the chameleon. Not the you one. Know, not the one, the chameleon. And kids, kids relate to that, it's, it's fun, it's, it's not dangerous to anybody. And kids can go home, they can play in their little color, watercolors and things like that, and it's, it's all about having a good time and the kids can, can, can uh, feed off of it. But aren't you concerned that it could send the wrong message? To it's kids? not sending the wrong message because that's what family You know, they could deliver the message, well, that guy right there has funny hair, but he's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy, and they see me on TV, they see that I love my daughter, that's the most important thing to me. And, and that's the bottom line. It's all about trying to make kids out to be something that they're not. Would you want kids to emulate you? I just want them to enjoy me, to feel the emotion, to feel the excitement, the thrill, and the agony, what I go through in a game. And I think they feel that because I reach out to the people. I like to have all the DNAs, all the 22,544 people that come in this building, DNA inside me. And then when I'm out there performing, I want them to feel it. I want them to feel the bumps and bruises. I want them to feel get the rebound. I want to feel everything. Are you content? Are you happy with yourself and what you've become? I'm happy in a sense where I know I can control everything around me now. I know that I can provide entertainment for myself instead of worry about people coming to entertain Dennis Rodman. I know the value of life, the value of, 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 of people, and things that's going to happen before and after. So that's, I think that, that, that's really getting Dennis Rodman over today. Does basketball matter to you? 
Basketball. Being a good basketball player and having respect? It's not been, I don't give a damn if I'm the best basketball player in the world. I just want to fit in and be one of the 12 person, one of the 12 players on the floor. That's all. Just, really? one of, just one of 12. There were some people who will hear this who think that's disingenuous, that that's not honest. Well, if they think they don't give a damn about basketball, why am I playing? Why am I out there doing my job? Why am I out there winning basketball games? Why am I being so productive? Why am I out there busting my ass every night to do something that no one wants to do? If I didn't give a damn about basketball, I'd just go out there and just be just like any other average basketball player. But, but I'm being productive. At 35 years old, I play like I'm 20 years old. And I'm having a great time. Rodman flopped it into a flagrant foul. And that they have Dennis Rodman who cheats all over the court. Had some very respect. What is your response to that? It's unfortunate that it has to be that way. You know, he asked me a question that he asked me a couple years ago. Do you want to play for Seattle? I said, Great, yeah, be awesome. You know, but you know, I think now it's all about head games. And I play that better than anybody in this business. And I can get over because I know that I'm a lot more mentally strong, physically strong, and go out there and do what I have to do. Well, the Bulls in general are doing what they have to do. We go to Peter Vesey, your take on Rodman. Well, we all know that you win championships in the NBA with strong defense, rebounding, psychological warfare. We know game one turned around when Frank Burkowski got thrown out after getting into an altercation with Rodman. Rodman dominated game two. And we know that in the history of this game, the only guys that have been able to dominate a game or a series without scoring a point are Magic Johnson, Bill Russell, and Dennis. Rodman. I'm not saying Rodman's confident or overconfident, but he's already measured his navel for a ring. <laughs> well, let's leave. Very nice. Let's leave the off-court persona aside for a moment, which is probably just as well. You admire the way he does it on his own terms on the court. Absolutely, Bob. You know, I, I think Dennis is very clever with the amount of moxie that he has in his game. Uh, he psychologically and physically neutralizes his opponents. I think he's been able to silence his critics his de detractors and all of the skeptics and you when you add the fact that he has so much athleticism and talent uh, you know this guy is just a complete package that night in and night out on the court you have to have respect for him okay when we come back we'll talk about the first half of the Bulls and Sonics try to think of enough superlatives Chicago up by 24 but first a message from Prudential and a word from the NBA Bulls lead the Sonics at the half in game three, 62 to 38. Pick a highlight. It was all red and black in the first half, and this is really what Seattle had to fear. They had a chance to win at least one in Chicago because the Bulls did not play anywhere near their full capability in the first two games, and still they escaped with a couple of victories. They come out completely in sync tonight. Well, the Bulls definitely came out in sync. Michael Jordan is leading the charge. And this is just a, a great Bulls team. If you look at the Sonics, they have been a team during the regular season and early in the playoffs who has been able to overcome huge deficits. But I don't think this is quite the same Sonics team that started out that seven-game series against the Jazz. I think the Jazz took a lot out of them, but that doesn't discount Chicago's greatness. They truly are right up there with the best of all time. Well, in fact, for whatever it's worth, among the 11 victor uh, defeats rather this year for the Bulls, including one in the playoffs, the biggest lead they relinquished in any of those games was 16 points here against Seattle back in November. But this is a whole different situation. No, you definitely. I think the uh, the fat scalper here in Seattle is already singing discount for game four. Uh, with all due respect to Michael and the Jordanaires, I believe that Phil Jackson and his coaching staff deserve the MVP for this series. For every series, they've been able to designate which player is not going to beat them and which player is going to take the open shot. Every opponent has had to adjust to them, and I don't know why that happens. Uh, they're doing a hell of a job. 
Well, Chicago at home simply won games. Tonight, they're making their statement. Now a couple of coaching notes. Johnny Davis, who was an assistant coach in Portland this past year, will be named the new head coach in Philadelphia tomorrow. And Peter Vesey tells us that Milwaukee has narrowed its coaching search to former Celtics coach Chris Ford or former Raptors coach Brendan Malone. And one other note, immediately following tonight's game three on CNBC, we'll bring you a half-hour post-game special. Our entire crew will be here with interviews and analysis on CNBC right after this game. Halftime in Seattle. The Bulls lead the Sonics by 24. Back to Marv, Matt, and Bill after these messages from your local station. This has been the Prudential Halftime Report, brought to you by Prudential. Live well, make a plan, be your own rock. Back in Seattle, the Bulls with a 24-point lead over the Seattle Sonics. Let's uh, check in with Hannah Storm, who is with Sonic coach George Carl. Hannah? George, what do you think happened to your team in the first half, and what do you tell them here at halftime? I think right now we just got to play and get back to trying to play with some confidence. You know, we broke apart. Uh, we got hit with a great, a great defensive effort early, and then Michael Jordan's great performance. I mean, they, they played a great, court, a great half on us, but we got to play back and just compete and get back to get some confidence in the game. Are they confident right now, or are, are they destroyed? I mean, do you think they have enough left to get back in this game? Well, this team, this team's always fought all year and has a lot of pride. I think you're going to see us fight. Okay. Good luck in the second half, Coach Mark. All right, thank you, uh, Hannah. Matt, uh, if you're in the Chicago locker room, where I know you would prefer to be <laughs> at this point, what, what does Phil Jackson uh, tell his club? Well, he's going to be serious with his team. He's going to say, we can't relax. We can't be complacent. We got this lead because we respected this Seattle ball club. We executed well. We defended well. All right, Bill, what, what can Seattle do here in the uh, second half? Oh, gee, thanks a lot, Mark, for that opportunity. They, yeah, they have to play for pride right now and, and try to keep together all the good things that Seattle has has done this year. It's been a great year, but not a good first half at all. They're in a lot of trouble. All right, a look at the Miller Lite halftime statistics, and you can see why Seattle is in trouble. Chicago, 23 of 44, 52% from the field. Seattle at 14 of 33, and Michael Jordan with 27 on 8 of 16 shooting. Three-point field goal, Chicago 5 of 8, Seattle in the midst of a drought right throughout the series from three-point territory. 0 for 8 tonight, and Peyton just eight points in the first half. We'll be back in Seattle in a moment. We are back at the Key Arena, which has been kept relatively quiet in this first half by this commanding Chicago lead. Let's check in with Ahmad Rashad. Ahmad? All right, thanks, Mark. Excuse me, Dick. I'm trying to do a reporting. <laughs> Phil Jackson, unlike in game two, didn't have much to say to his team at halftime, but he did say that the second half will mean nothing if they can't take off, take, pick up where they left off in the first half. Also, to be wary of Seattle coming out and pressing. Mark? Oh, that... Official Dick Pavetta is such a wacky guy, isn't he? He'll do anything for odd camera time. Seattle starting Frank Brokowski in the second half, not going with Irvin Johnson, who's been the starter. Maybe Frank Brokowski can give him something from the perimeter as the Sonics really struggle from downtown. Audley comes out, followed by Brokowski. Shot clock is down at two. Here is Longley. Longley with 12 points, and the Bulls now lead 64-38. Marv, remember what Michael was telling us before the game about how he was lecturing Luke about when you get popped in the eye like that, take those five stitches. you got to come out and show him that you're not going to allow that to happen anymore. Longley's done it with his game today. Took an inadvertent elbow from Sean Kemp. And uh, actually wanted to leave and Phil Jackson was saying, no, you play through it. You stay on the floor. But, of course, with the uh, blood dripping down, he was forced to leave. And uh, Jordan was upset because he felt that uh, Longley was uh, just too low-key about taking that shot. And that is another Seattle turnover. It is turnover number 13. And Michael Jordan slipped and fell into one of our cameramen on that last play and just went over to make sure that he was all right as Michael went hard to the floor. But that was a terrible pass by Gary Payton. Well, well behind Frank Brakowski on the dead run. Kukoc for three. Longley tried to punch it on the back tap, but carried out of bounds. 
Oh, Michael Jordan with that, what has now become the patented get up in the air fadeaway shot, just kept fading all the way back and all over our NBC cameraman. Crowd trying to urge on the Sonics. Kemp fouled by Longley. That's three on Luke Longley. No team in the history of the NBA Finals has ever come back from more than 21 down at the half to win. The Sonics trailing by 24 at halftime. That's the biggest comeback victory in the history of the, the finals. Baltimore beat Philadelphia back in April of 1948, coming back from a 21-point a deficit. Bulls now lead 64-40. Sorry I don't have anything more to give you on that Baltimore-Philly game in 48 hours. Well, I know Matt uh, can fill us in on that one. <laughs> Freddie Scaleri win the backcourt for the Baltimore Bullets. I knew to know that. Did you coach him, too? <laughs> The defense by the Sonics. Pippen. And it's a 24 second violation of the basketball knockdown. Pippen just tossed it up looking to hit the rim and Rodman trying to save it. And now there's a discussion. Rodman is applauding the call. Perhaps they are changing the call. Steve Jabby, Hugh Evans, Dick Bavetta talking about whether that should be a 24-second violation. If not, the basket would count. So tough because they have to visualize the replay in their mind. Of course, not allowed to use television replays. There is no 24-second violation the score, because the ball And uh, we'll get the ruling. Here's Chicago another look at it. So Dick raised the rim. So the basket does not count, but they'll uh, see how they reset the clock. They'll put some time back up. Well, they'd have to give them a full 24 because the ball right hit the rim. And a good ruling by the officials as, as the shot clock sounded and the whistle blew, just everybody basically stopped other than the alert Dennis Rodman. And there again was Sean Kemp unable to keep Dennis Rodman off the board. Hannah was talking about that's what they did all day yesterday in practice. Interesting how they wait until before game three to realize he had to block Dennis Rodman off. Koski trying to tie up Longley. Jordan. Rebounded by Bukowski. And he nearly threw it away. Hawkins eluding Jordan who picks up the foul. That is his first. I've always loved it, Mark, when, when these great players like Jordan and Barkley and Bird and Magic, who are so involved in every play, and finally, midway through the second half, oh, the, there's their first foul. Kowski just left a lot of three for Hersey Hawkins. But Dennis had a bit more out of it, though, as he uh, went to the floor. for Seattle in the Utah series. Here, Dennis Rodman and Brakowski getting all tangled up. And Dennis, with a flop there, just taking the little bump from Brakowski. I don't know, a forearm to the throat. It was a <laughs> Hawkins is fouled. Chicago has to be careful because Seattle has come out as the aggressors in this half. That will get the crowd back into it. Once that crowd gets going, it is impossible to get them back in their seats. Chicago, not really a single good play in the opening three and a half minutes of the third. Foul on Pippen. Percy Hawkins. This evening, that is only his fifth point here. Steve Kerr replacing Tony Kukoc. Tony Kukoc providing a lift for the Bulls in the first half start of the game because Rod Hopper is bothered by a knee problem. Kukoc with nine points. 
So the Bulls now lead 64-45 pressure by the Sonics. And Longley is able to bring it across. One of the reasons for Kerr is that he is expert against the trapping, pressing defenses that Seattle's going to throw on the rest of this game. Longley. And Jordan able to keep it alive. A new 24 for the Bulls. Jordan fouled. Rakowski with the wraps on Michael Jordan. Frank Rakowski involved, picking up his third person. And Rakowski and Rodman having some uh, extracurricular talk there. Michael Jordan once again quickly getting over to Rodman and pulling him away. Well, the crowd here in Seattle very much back into it. The Sonics chipping away, but still trailing by 19. tell from the talk of George Carl in that halftime say hey guys we gotta let it all go right here Frank Bukowski if you can get somebody involved do it Sean Kemp you have to start getting physically involved in this ball game 7-0 run by the Sonics Bulls have led by as many as 26 Prep. rebounded by Longley Crowd wanted a traveling violation on Longley. Well, that's the kind of offensive play that's typified Seattle all day. Trying to beat a guy, a great defensive player, one-on-one, -on -one, going to your left with a fadeaway jumper. And here's a fadeaway jumper by Rodman. It is a three-second violation ball. This is the kind of Seattle defense that I think everybody in this building, and I know we expected at the start of this game, very physical, very grabby, clutchy, and just get into the chest and into the face of the Chicago Bulls. The Bulls never let them get into that early in the first quarter. Yes, the Sonics swarming defensively here in the third. And they've cut into that Bulls lead. Again, a whistle, three seconds against Chicago. And the call by Steve Jabby over on the weak side. Probably could have called something else there as Rodman and Brinkowski get all tangled up. And then the three second violation. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Bud Light, official sponsor of the 1996 Olympic Summer Games. Make it a Bud Light by Oldsmobile and your authorized Aurora retailers. And by Reebok. Are you prepared to say, this is my planet? Well, Seattle's defense has gotten serious here at the start of the third quarter, challenging every pass, every shot, and here's Sean Kemp popping Rodman in the chest, and as they get all tangled up, Something could have been called there of a foul nature, but the official wisely called the three-second violation. He should be happy with that call. Well, Dennis Rodman has to be very careful. This is where he usually has his problems. When they're way up, the game is not in the balance. And where was this physical response from Seattle early on in this series? Well, the Bulls have not scored in four and a half minutes. They've been outscored here in the third, seven to two. Kemp had it excellently knocked away by Payton. Able to recover and hit. The ball 64 and the Sonics 47, six and a half remaining in the third quarter. Balls in this third quarter, turned it over three times. Only one of seven from the field. Make it one of the last eight. So difficult for a team with a huge lead to come out with that edge and that sharpness. Very dangerous for Chicago as they're in danger of losing this entire lead. All right, Pippen with the rebound on the Shrep miss. Well, the Bulls with a magnificent first half, probably their best of the playoff run. Rodman able to keep it alive, and now lost it. Peyton with the steal. Hawkins for three. 
They just cannot hit from downtown, and it leads to this. A fast break bucket by George. And George Carl has been saying it. If we don't make threes, we cannot win. What a beautiful play by Steve Kerr to start that two-on-one break. Uh, Kemp with the spin move, but had nowhere to go. Burkowski for three, and he is able to hit. A three-pointer for Burkowski. And the ball's now lead, 66 to 50. So Seattle, two of 12 from downtown. That's Burkowski's offensive game. Feed off the penetration, spot up at the line. What a pass, George. Long lead. Defensive play. Well, Luke Longley wisely keep moving, find the open area as Jordan is double teamed, and then Luke Longley trying to do the right thing, take it strong in the basket, but just unable to finish that play off against the bigger, stronger, quicker Seattle defenders. who is becoming a factor in the third quarter. Foul called on Rodman. That's three on Rodman and the Bulls. Now with 4.53 to go in this third quarter, leading by 16. A look at the block by Murkowski. Way too casual by Pittman. Rikowski showing the skills that he has. Spot up shooter, good interior, rugged defender. looking for help, and then was hit by Kerr. For the Bulls, their fifth team foul. Chicago has done nothing in this third quarter. They've come out, they've scored a total of four points. They're all standing around, thinking that it's over. Now Seattle is just surging, roaring. The crowd is behind them. This is when they play their best when their backs are against the wall, as they certainly are. Well, Tony Kukoc took that last jump shot deep in the left corner, felt he was hit on the wrist and arm, and then turned to the official begging for the call. If he had alertly followed his own miss, he would have probably got the rebound, and all of his teammates remind him, don't worry about non falls keep playing. The Sonics have outscored the Bulls 14-4 on the first. It's down to a 14-point lead. Kemp knocked it out of bounds. Nice catch by Cindy Crawford in the uh, front row. And uh, there's Cindy getting herself involved in the game. Wearing the Dennis Rodman hat. Timeout has been called with 4.18 remaining in the third. The Bulls only two of 13 for the field in this third quarter. Well, the NBA and NBC Sports have teamed up and created the official website for the NBA Finals at finals.com. Game previews, player bios, video highlights, the latest news on the Bulls and the Sonics, plus during our NBC broadcast of the finals, fans around the globe can interact with our very own cybercaster, Steve Snapper Jones. Busy at work, as you can see. He'll be online with commentary and answering fan questions during the course of the game. Check out the official website of the NBA at NBC Sports at finals.com. 4.15 in this third quarter, and the Bulls now appear to be the team that is rattled. They throw it away 
giving the Sonics another opportunity. A Chicago Bulls team that has got two of 13 from the field. They've been outscored 14 to four here in the third, which has usually been their quarter. That's uh, the case in games one and two. Perkins trying to dump it off. Pippen able to step right into that passing lane. Marvin Mod was telling us the last time out that Phil Jackson's telling his team to weather the storm. They'll get tired eventually. The problem with that strategy is that these fans won't let them get tired. Ouch, what a wild and horrible shot. Here comes Peyton. Hawkins. And he draws the foul. He was blocked. Now on Steve Kerr. So the Bulls have scored only four points in this third quarter. It's unbelievable. 3.33 remaining in the quarter. Fewest points in a quarter in the NBA Finals. 11. New York Knicks against the Los Angeles Lakers, April 30th, 1972. Well, the Bulls just have not done enough with their defense to create some fast breakdown opportunities. And then when they have to walk the ball into the front court and try to run their triangle offense, the pressure defense of Seattle has just totally taken them out of the rhythm. Percy Hawkins, four for four. Perfect execution of the set offense. Take the ball to one side, double down on the other for Steve Kerr. Kemp able to get inside. Sean Kemp got off to the slow start. He has now become a factor. He has 12 points. And Barr, it's a very tough matchup. Who coach trying to keep Kemp away from the basket? He can only hope to get it back on the offensive end. Can of defense. Shot clock at seven. Pippen. Oh, beautiful move with a head fake on Hersey Hawkins. And Phil Jackson and the Chicago bench are wondering why Steve Kerr was not credited with a three-point shot. Apparently they did wave it off. Call it a two. Here's Wingate for three. Michael Jordan's got to get more assertive. He's got to start calling for that ball, waving his teammates away so he can get to the hoop. Shot clock at six. Kevin. Here come the Sonics. Just under two minutes to go in the third. Facing the double team. The steal by Pippen. Kuko chased by Perkins. The Bulls with a 73-59 lead. Wow, Steve Kerr in trouble under duress with the post-up of Gary Payton and his teammates came quickly to his aid and took forced the turnover. Matt, you mentioned the Bulls defense not getting it done. They've upped it. In that low post, Gary Payton, who has tortured all the short guards in the Western Conference, realized he's got Kerr, but the double team just leads to easy fast breaks. Well, by Weddington. And again, Hawkins, one of the NBA's better free throw shooters. At the line, he's five for five here tonight. Eight points for Hersey, seven of the eight in this comeback in third quarter. Now, when Gary Payton gets in that position with a guy like Steve Carroll, I and mean, he's got to anticipate double team, and that's where he's got to find his three-point shooters. The only two on the floor right now are Hersey Hawkins and Sam Perkins, but they have to be spotted up and spaced correctly. A Chicago lead once 24. It's now 12. I'm surprised Phil Jackson hasn't come back with Dennis Rodman. Maybe he was upset with the fact that Rodman was losing his 
Poole in concentration with the big lead. And the outside official, Steve Chabby, calling it on Hawkins. First in the last two minutes. On shooting foul. For the Bulls, their first team foul the last two minutes. I think Phil just does want to weather this storm now and make sure that he has fresh troops for the final eight minutes of this ballgame. Two coach watched by Kemp. Wingate is on Jordan. Pippen is really hesitating when he gets that initial pass. Jordan makes the play. They double team him, and when Scotty gets it, he's got to go right away with it. Don't stop and wait. But then you got to start all over again. Down to 40 seconds remaining in the third. Hawkins got the step. Woodgate. Mark Seattle's right back in this game. Just down 12. The crowd is on the edge of their seats. You can just hear them, feel them breathing down on your necks here. Their offense has really picked up. This is Seattle's sonic basketball. But this is as tough and intense a defense as you'll see all season long from two teams on the same floor. Bill Wellington with a second field goal. It's the ball 75, the Sonics 61, 10 seconds to go in the third quarter. Down to five. Wingate. And that is it for the third quarter. Seattle outscores Chicago 23-13. Into it. Trailing by 24 at the half, trailing by as many as 26. It is now a 14 point game. Bill Wennington with the quarter jump a moment ago to extend that Chicago lead. Dennis Rodman sitting out a good portion of this third quarter. We'll be back with the fourth after these messages and a word from your local station. Rewrited telecast of the National Basketball Association may not be retransmitted, reproduced, or rebroadcast without the express written consent of the NBA. Back at Key Arena in Seattle, Marv Albert, Matt Gukas, Bill Walton, Ahmad Rashad, had a storm, Bob Costas, the entire crew on hand, and uh, we have seen this crowd in a frenzy right throughout the third quarter. The Sonics getting back into it. Chicago shooting only six of 19 for the field in the third. Michael Jordan, only two points in the third quarter, was uh, not part of the offense, but figures to be a different story here in the fourth. Jordan now with 31. Uh, one of those old UCLA plays, Bill, the <laughs> UCLA cut, and Michael Jordan able to shed David Wingate and get that open jump shot. And that play was all over the blackboard in Seattle's locker room. That high post shuffle. When Wennington sets that pick, Kukoc will just dump it right down to him. Sam Perkins too late. The guard, I think, has to go ball side on that play with Jordan particularly so you can front him down low if he does take that post position. And a foul on Wennington, a non-shooting affair. Peyton putting the spin on Kerr. Kerr on the loose ball. Foul is called on Payton. Steve Kerr was not a factor in the first two games in Chicago. Gary Payton gets called for this foul here on Dennis Rodman. Just holds him, keeps him from coming up the lane, and then says, well, who, me? I didn't foul him. And a technical foul has been called. It's on Payton, who apparently had something else to say in the direction of Steve Javi. It's been a very tough series for Gary Payton. In game two, he shot only six of 15. Game one, 
played 47 minutes, only six of 17 from the field. And it's hard to understand what he could possibly be complaining about. He clearly grabbed Dennis Rodman. It was a good, good call. Bulls by 17. And Kukoc took the hit. Met by the double team of Shrimp and Wingate. Foul on, on David Wingate. And Gary Payton continues to glare at the official Steve Jabby, who called the technical foul on him. That will not help his cause one little bit. Jordan with the pull up. Yes! And a jump! Foul committed by Wingate. And Jordan to the line. So kind of a restful third quarter for Michael Jordan, who is certainly right back to it. It just appears as if the Bulls and Michael Jordan can do whatever they want, whenever they want. Seattle comes back, plays their best basketball of the series in the third, and right away, Michael Jordan says, hey, just give me the ball and get out of the way. Jumper in your face. And hey, Frank Krakowski was not a catalyst by any means, but he did give the Sonics a different look, more physical play, and seemed to give the team a lift. A little surprised he's not in there right now. And yeah, this call away from the ball. Robert on camp. That's four on Dennis Robin. Uh, Dennis Robin, who plays very tough, low post defense and has that habit of snapping that neck back. Nobody ever hits him in the face when he does that. That was not a defensive foul on Dennis Robin. And another one on Dennis Robin. over to the scorer's table. He will come on for Rodman. Rodman and Kemp underneath the basket. Hard to see where that foul is on Dennis Rodman. Sean Kemp initiated everything. This points out the, the, you know, the problem that Ron Harper not being available today, just not the regular rotations to keep Kukoc in the back, in the front court. But obviously uh, the Bulls have managed despite that. <laughs> Uh, it helps when you have Michael Jordan on your team in a lot of different respects. A 20-point Chicago lead. Two coach for three. And Perkins with the box out. Shrep had to save that uh, lead thrown by Payton. Here's Payton. Gary Payton. With 12 points, he's in 5 of 12 from the field. The Bulls now lead by 18. You see this lineup for the Chicago occasionally with both Longley and Wennington on the floor, but I'm sure it won't be too long before Scottie Pippen re-enters. Absolutely, because the Bulls are so much better when they go small. But the way Longley is playing today, I, I'd go with him and make <laughs> Seattle match up to him, which they have not done. Well, Longley now has 14 points. Perkins will make the taken down by Waddington. Here comes Frank Burkowski getting set to check back in. Timeout is called. 9 37 left in the fourth quarter. Miller, where great taste runs in the family, brings you Miller Moments. Tonight's Miller Moment took place 11 years ago this evening. The Los Angeles Lakers defeating the Boston Celtics. Game six of the finals to take the 1985 NBA title. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar led the way for the Lakers and was named the series' most valuable player. In recognition of that moment, Miller Brewing Company will donate $1,000 to the uh, Thurgood Marshall Scholarship Fund. And at 38 years of age, Kareem, the oldest player ever to win the uh, MVP award. That was the eighth time the Lakers met the uh, Celtics in the finals and the first time that they ever beat Boston. Nine and a half remaining in the fourth quarter. Game three of the NBA Finals. The season very much on the line for the Sonics, who are trailing here by 20 points. The Bulls with a burst at the start to take the energy out of the crowd. Michael Jordan with a sensational first half. The Sonics able to get back into it in the third quarter. But the Bulls have come out strong here in the fourth. 
and a foul is called against Seattle. The high point man of the game is uh, Michael Jordan. Jordan with 34 points. Sean Kemp just picked up his fourth personal foul, and it will put Luke Longley at the line. Well, Luke bouncing back very nicely here in game three. In game two, he had as many stitches as he did points and rebounds combined, five. But he came out in this first quarter and really made a statement offensively, much as he did in game one. That's not a good day when your stitches <laughs> outnumber your points and rebounds combined. But that play all set up by Tony Kukoc. Sean Kemp has not shown an ability to contain him on the perimeter. Tony in game one and two was critical at the decisive moments. That play against setting it all up with penetration. And a knee offered up by uh, Longley. Indication from the official Dick Preventer. That's four. On Longley, the Bulls are now over the limit. Luke wanted his interpretation. For that last offensive sequence for Chicago that Luke Longley ended up getting the shot, that shows how far Luke Longley has come. Career playoff high today. Early in the season, Scottie Pippen never would have dumped that ball off to Luke Longley. I mean, he would throw it to him at the beginning of the game, and Luke would drop it out of bounds or commit an offensive foul. Now, though, after a year with Jordan, he's fully developed. The Bulls 84, and the Sonics 65. Pippen for three with two seconds remaining on the clock. And Pippen, as soon as he came off the bench with Rodman going out with five fouls, Scotty gets a big rebound, a couple of nice passes, and a huge three. Scotty Pippen with 12 points. And Scotty has done it once again in a number of departments. Eight rebounds, eight assists. Although he has not shot well at 5 for 14. Lamar with the Bulls. Oh, Longley off the penetration again. Kemp can't keep him under control. George Carl needs another timeout. What a game for Luke Longley. 17 points for the product of Australia. 7.55 to go in the fourth quarter. And the Bulls now lead 89-65. That's Pippen from three-point range with the shot clock running down. We'll be back at the Key Arena in a moment. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Goodyear, number one in tires. By Prudential, live well, make a plan, be your own rock. And by New Miller Beer, the brand new beer from Miller with big flavor that goes down easy. We are coming up on 7 p.m. here in the Pacific Northwest with just under eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. A reminder, following our telecast here on NBC, we invite you to tune to CNBC on your cable system for an NBA Finals post-game special. Our entire cast will be on hand to recount the game with highlights. We'll hear from some of the players. You'll see some of the press conferences as we look back at the game three here in Seattle. Kowski with a second field goal. That's the NBA Finals post-game special immediately following the game. NBC. The Bulls with an 89-67 lead. Longley. And he was fouled. Marvin, it's so special to watch this Bull team, which is truly unique in a lot of different ways. But when they pass the ball, when they get rid of the ball, they just keep moving. So many teams stand and watch. So many teams feel that, it, or players, they don't have the ball. They're not doing anything. These guys are always in motion, moving away, setting screens, coming back to the ball. A thing of beauty to watch. Well, they are the only team in the league that runs this triangle offense to this degree. And with the spacing involved and with all the cuts, 
Brown with all the backdoor type of passes it affords all that kind of movement. Luke Longley must love this key arena. He had his career <laughs> higher. Right. Even though the Bulls have lost that game early in the year, he had a career high in 121. How about a career move he's gone for the Minnesota Timberwolves, where he lost 67 games back in 91-92 to the NBA Finals. I think he likes Michael Jordan, not so much the key <laughs> arena. Longley called for that tripping foul that put Gary Payton on the floor. Well, that's a good foul by Longley. Still sporting the bandage from the five stitches. The little guard comes in and sets the screen on him. You can't let that happen. And here's Dennis Rodman back. So Longley with a playoff career high of 19 points. This game being seen worldwide, but uh, you know they're enjoying it in uh, Luke's native land of, of Australia, a member of the 1988-1992 uh, Australian Olympic teams. This is certainly his finest moment as a professional. And Jordan fouled by Hawkins and Rodman and Kurkowski getting involved. And Phil Jackson at the other end of the floor taking a very long look and now whistling to his team out there. He does not want Dennis to do anything that is not going to have him ready for a game four. You just have your heart in your throat at all times when they get tangled up. And see, Dennis initiates all that by getting his arms tangled up underneath the other player and then makes it appear that in this case, Frank Brokowski <laughs> is doing the holding. It, once again, with, with the game not in the balance, a 22-point lead. But these, <laughs> that's, these are certainly two of the freest spirits in the NBA. We don't need it any sort of altercation here that would take away from this beautiful exhibition of basketball today by the Chicago Bulls. Now, would this be considered yeah. taunting? I was just going to say, why is that not taunting? Just a look and almost baiting Frank Brokowski to do something. Dennis has to settle down, play basketball, go play golf with the Michael Jordan tomorrow and get ready for game four. But if you can't stand there at attention and look at somebody with a blank expression on your face what are you allowed to do uh, i think that was a bit more than <laughs> <time ago. laughs> and a foul on Pippen. that is his third the bulls are over the foul limit coming into this nba final series all the Bulls were saying that, well, the 72 victory season is certainly wonderful. They're able to roar through the uh, playoff in Miami and then New York and Orlando. But it wouldn't mean a thing. They felt it wouldn't mean anything until they, as Michael Jordan put it, completed the picture. And they are now playing for a place in NBA history. And uh, they wanted to come up with an effort here tonight, at least in one of these games, that would be clear cut because they have felt that they have not played well against the Sonics. And they have certainly come through here this evening. Well, they won't admit it because they don't believe in taunting the opposition. But they had to have a, a, a meeting between the key guys and said, hey, look, let's go undefeated during these playoffs. They did lose the one to the Knicks in game three. And again, uh, Burkowski and Rodman come together, and the officials very quick to move to that scene. Burkowski with, with number four. Rodman flashing to the ball. No need to, to overplay or try to deny him. Dennis is not looking to swing that sky hook across the middle. Uh, Gary Payton doing a lot of trash talking. He needs a little bit more game to back that talk up. Gary Payton coming in as a brilliant player, over 20 points a game. In the series, he's got 40 points total in the series. That's the uh, story tonight. Jordan, 11, 22, 36 points. And uh, Payton only 5 of 13, 14 points, along with eight assists. You mentioned the playoff run, Bill, of the Bulls their way to making it a record of 14 and 1 in the playoffs. Shrimp. And 
Jordan able to box out Kemp. In traffic going up with one of the best rebounders in the league, Sean Kemp, as both Jordan and Pippen with Rodman in and out of this lineup throughout the game have both gotten much more involved in the rebounding area, as they tend to do when Dennis is not getting a whole bunch. Shot clock, down to four. Jordan. And Rodman and Brakowski get involved. It looks like Pavetta has given the ejection sign. This has been brewing the last couple of minutes. I think he's thrown both out of the game. Ejected, flagrant foul two. I thought Pavetta indicated that both were tossed. Let's see. Well, this has been brewing ever since these two have gotten on the floor there, as this time Burkowski does get that forearm and elbow right into the Adam's apple of Dennis Rodman. But uh, George Carl, who was ridiculing Rodman for all the things that he was getting away with after game one, had nothing but praise for Dennis Rodman after game two. I think we're going to hear more ridiculing after this one. Dick Pavetta gave a succession of thumbs, but apparently he was making it clear that it was Burkowski who was gone, and uh, Rodman remains, and now he and Kemp are having words. Very difficult for George Carl to ridicule the starting power forward leading rebounder in the series when you're down 3-0. 5.45 remaining in the fourth quarter. <laughs> Phil Jackson should do, do this game a favor, maybe take Rodman out. Rodman and Kemp coming together, and Kemp picks up number five. On the other hand, Phil Jackson may be enjoying the fact that uh, Dennis Rodman has gotten into the heads of the Seattle players. And uh, Michael Jordan just came over, <laughs> giving us a look, as if to say, <laughs> he's kind of amused by it, but what's going on here? And uh, Phil Jackson just picking up at the clock again, wishing this thing would end without getting any further incident from Dennis Rodman. D Phil Jackson, I'm sure, has already started uh, thinking about Wednesday, and he knows they'll want to have Dennis Rodman on the floor. But Dennis is quick to point out that he has not thrown a punch in 10 years in this league. Bulls 96, and the Sonics 70 in a blowout. Sonics did rally, got within 11 with their surge in the third quarter, but the Bulls picked it right back up in the fourth. Again, Mark, a nice play by Gary Payton, but just one guy involved. Dribble up the whole way, get in the post, everybody else standing around watching for Seattle. There's three men involved, and then come back to the weak side. Go cut. Foul. And he will head to the lines on Perkins. Bill Wennington checking in. Dennis Rodman very upset that he's the man going to the bench. And I'm sure Phil Jackson will breathe a sigh. Well, uh, for Dennis, certainly a guy who enjoys the circus atmosphere that he has created. But there's no question that uh, he has bothered the Seattle Supersonics, along with what has taken place on the scoreboard. That is a uh, contributing factor. It's embarrassing, Marv, to get blown out in your home court. You come back, you wait all these years to get back to the finals. The, the disappointments the last couple years, first round playoff losses, they think they got it going. They play Chicago well two times and then come back here and lay down. Series very quiet in games one and two, 16 for Shrek. And the Bulls now lead 98 to 75. The last time the Bulls were here in Seattle was back on November the uh, 26th, and the Sonics beat the Bulls in a come from behind effort. That was more than six months ago, though. Shot clock down to one. Bushler. It's a 24.
Well, I wouldn't say the Seattle team laid down in any way, shape, or form. They just got hit by a buzzsaw at the start of this game, the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan, and how he likes to assert himself on the road in these playoff situations. He gets, I think, more pleasure out of winning these games on the road than at home. And Michael will send it out the rest of the way. That's the uh, final numbers, 11 of 23, 36 points. And he was 11 for 11 at the line. Foul committed by Randy Brown. For Michael Jordan, his high game in this series. And uh, certainly feeling much better about things. He was very unhappy, very frustrated, but about the way he played and about the way the club played, although they beat the Sonics in game two. And I'm sure it made him feel good and helped the whole ball club by getting after Tony Kukoc about those couple of times where he passed up some shots and jumping on Luke Longley about maybe feeling sorry for himself with those five stitches. And I think that definitely picked up those two players, and I think it worked the rest of the ball club up as well. Plus, they've found their rhythm now. They're back to playing every other day now, which is the regular NBA schedule. That long layoff really did hurt them. Nice passing, Scotty Pippen. And Phil Weddington is three for three. He's given the balls a 100 to 78 lead with three and a half remaining in this fourth quarter. Game four here on Wednesday night. 9 o'clock Eastern time, 6 out of the West. Phil Jackson now has Randy Brown and Doug Bushler on the floor along with Scotty Pippen, Tony Kuko, and Bill Wennington. But Mark, look how it keeps going. The flow is still there. Dribble away, pass back up top. Screen away, half to the weak side, spot up jumper. And Randy Brown is 2 for 2, including a 3 earlier. Has five points, pulls 102-78 over the Sonics. We mentioned coming into tonight's game that only two teams have ever come back from a 2-0 deficit to win in the NBA Finals. No one has ever come back from a 3-0 to win an NBA Final Series. Timeout called the Bulls, certainly enjoying things. 2.43 remaining in the fourth quarter. And it's Chicago 102 and Seattle 78. And as we were headed to commercial, there was a uh, technical foul called on Detlef Schrempf. Detlef was fouled on a three-point jumper a minute or so ago. They didn't call it. The game's over. But he wants to get to that line to shoot his three free throws. He's not getting there. Three-point shooting has been a major problem for the Sonics throughout this series and give the Chicago defense a lot of credit. Because they have challenged most of them. Obviously, Randy Brown got a piece of the arm on Shrimp on that one, just going by that reaction. But Chicago probably has figured this kind of defense out more than any other team in the league. They will live with some post-up scoring from a guy like Kemp or a guy like Shaquille O'Neal, but they do not want to let the good three-point shooters get off and get going and then get other people involved and get second shot opportunities and it has worked to perfection throughout these playoffs but the versatility of the Bulls man allows them to change that to whoever they're playing against is the reason that you think you have a chance in the post-up game is that's where they have Longley, that's where they have a, a short power forward in Dennis Rodman and a, and a poor interior defender in Tony Kukoc. You certainly don't think your, your, your game is going to be winning by beating Michael Jordan one on one on the perimeter. Wennington, Steve Scheffler, and Eric Snow, seldom used players by the Sonics, have uh, taken the floor, so George Carl emptying his bench in these final minutes and uh, we have now reached garbage time i don't know is that possible in the nba finals i guess it is two minutes to go the bulls with a 103 80 lead on their way to making it 3-0 in this best of seven steve kerr going to the left hand Movement without the ball, a thing of beauty. 
Shrimp. 105 to 82. And we're down to a minute and a half to go. This uh, crowd is filing out. They have waited to the last few moments. Bushler able to drill it. This capacity crowd are better than the 17,000 staying to the very end despite the fact that the home team has been rocked solidly. Hawkins on the fake. Percy Hawkins with 12. That left Shrimp leading the Sonics with 20. Gary Payton with 19. But uh, these numbers are just cosmetic. The Sonics working their way back into it in the third quarters. They came within 11. But uh, the Bulls were able to accelerate once again and uh, recapture the big lead. Bushler to the line, fouled by Eric Snow, the rookie from Michigan State. Uh, it has been a roller coaster ride for these Seattle fans over the last three years. The getting knocked out in the first round, the last couple, and then looking like they had that Utah series well in hand, losing game five here at Key Arena, getting blown out at Salt Lake in game six, and then barely hanging on to win game seven. So this crowd has been penalized and teased. Here's Brown. Hit by Snow, and Randy Brown will, will go to the line. And again, the, the questions will surface regarding that man, George Carl, who certainly has not been happy about his contract situation. George Carl did have his contract extended for next year. Would like to have that long-term extension. Of course, Phil Jackson his contract up at the end of this season. No extension there yet. Now to a half minute remaining in the fourth quarter. 108 to 84. Woodgate. So the Chicago Bulls in a blowout of the Seattle Sonics. They opened up with a burst, anticipating the, the high energy from this crowd. And uh, they were able to just take it all out of the Sonics right at the start. Time has run out. The Bulls winning game three, 108, 86. The Bulls led by Michael Jordan who finished 11 of 23 from the field, 36 points. And now the Bulls and the Sonics look to game number four here in Seattle on Wednesday night. That'll be a 9 o'clock start in the East, 6 o'clock on the West Coast. All right, let's go to Ahmad Rashad with Michael Jordan. Ahmad. All right, thanks, Marv. Michael, finally a game that you guys can feel some satisfaction with. You won the last two games, but really not played very well. Today you played excellent. Well, I thought we were going to give it away a little bit in the third quarter, but I think the first half we came out and basically took the crowd out of the game and uh, you know took some of their momentum very early. And from that point on, I think we tried to control everything, and, and we pretty much did. I think when they started making a run at us in the third quarter, we just had to find something to, to contain them and slow them down because they were coming very hard. How do you account for that start that you had today? Because in game two, you guys started you know, very lethargic, no energy, but not tonight. Well, as, as I said, I think when we get on the road, we became we become a little more focused. You know, we go out and we know what our jobs are, and you know we have to we don't have to worry about you know family tickets and all a lot of distractions that we have to go through. Man, it's good to be on the road so we can bond together and play better. How about your focus? I know in the first couple of games you felt like you were struggling a little bit, but today you came in talking about making a statement. Well, I know this is the gloves' home, and you know I wasn't going to verbalize you know any kind of confrontation with them. You know, I was just going to come out and play and let my let my uh, basketball do all my talking and you know, I know this crowd can get very hostile but you know me personally these are the things I like to I like to play at in the atmosphere that I like to play at just come in and focus on basketball and block everything else out all right Michael thanks a lot great game all right let's go over to Jim Gray who is uh, with Dennis Rodman all right thank you very much Amaya. Dennis you came out and you crushed him 
in the first 10 minutes of the game. Was that the game plan? Michael Jordan said before the game, that's what needed to be done. Well, I look at it like this. You know, all night long I've been saying, you know, I, I couldn't sleep. I said, we got to get this game. We have to get this game. And uh, Michael, I figured Michael come out and do, do, his, do his job. And, uh, and the rest of the supporting guys did theirs too. Three nothing. No team in NBA history has ever been able to come back from that deficit. Is this one effectively over? I would say it's, it's effectively over. I just think that, you know, Seattle's have totally got out their rhythm, out their game, because all they're doing now is trying to mess with me, try to get in my head. But they don't understand, though. You can't mess with the master. You can't mess with the master. Well, there was an awful lot of talk going on between you and Sean Kemp and Gary Payton. What exactly was being said and going on in Burkowski as well? Uh, I think Josh called just basically bring Rakowski in and try to, to mess with me. But you got to understand something. It's, it's, it's the difference between trying to come out there and play basketball and be physical and doing your job, and they're not doing that right now. All they're trying to do is try to be physical, and that's not their game. Will it be a long three days for you guys? Is it going to be hard for you to remain concentrated and, and trying to wrap this thing up? I'm, I didn't play all night tonight, so I'm ready to go tomorrow. And the next day, the next day, I'm ready to go. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's okay. get it over with. Hello, okay, Dennis, Congratulations. Let's go back to Marv Albert. All right, Jim, you can't mess with the master. We take that away from game number three. We'll be right back in Seattle after this. Back in Seattle, the Bulls with a 108-86 win over the Sonics to take a 3-0 lead in the NBA final series. Some more of the uh, stats. Scotty Pippen, 12 points, 9 assists. Tony Kukoc, who started for the ailing Ron Hopper, 14 points, 7 rebounds. Michael Jordan, though, leading the way with 36 points in his 41 minutes. A reminder coming up next on most of these NBC stations, a, a special post-game episode of Mad About You. That'll be must-see TV. That is coming up next. Some closing comments from uh, Matt and Bill, what about that Chicago defensive effort right from the start? Well, Marv, we were talking about it earlier, how good it's been in the third quarter and the fourth quarter, especially throughout all the playoffs. Well, it was excellent in the first quarter, getting off to that big lead, 34-16, to 16, and continuing to be harassing defensively and forcing those turnovers, forcing 21 turnovers as everybody put it together, led, of course, by Michael Jordan. And as Dennis Rodman uh, pointed out, through some other philosophical thoughts that were <laughs> mentioned to uh, Jim Gray. The Bulls have just taken the Sonics right out of the rhythm. They're not playing their usual game except for that period defensively where we saw them swarming, swarming all over the court uh, in the third quarter. But Marv, that was more of a scramble. Now, Seattle has to remember that they're a very good team that is unfortunately matched up against a truly great team, maybe the greatest team in history. And they have to look at this in the big picture, the long term. Still with the young star, don't lose your point. Boys, don't lose your composure. Try to keep everything together. Keep the fans interested in with, and with hope. And then learn from this. Learn, Marv, how hard Michael Jordan has sacrificed to work to get to where he is right now. That's the mission and purpose for Gary Payton and Sean Kemp the rest of the way. Now right, let's take a look at the uh, scoring totals. The Bulls with a balanced attack. Jordan with the uh, 36. Longley, that is a career playoff high. 8 of 13. An outstanding all-around performance by the Bulls center. Luke Longley, 19 points in all. Tony Kukoc, 4 of 11, 14 points. Uh, Scotty Pippen, uh, 5 of 14. Did not shoot well. Finished with 12, but uh, did other things in terms of rebounding and assists. And as it turns out, uh, you mentioned the fact that the Bulls were slightly out of their rhythm at the start because Kukoc started. Obviously, it did not matter. Well, Michael Jordan just was perfect today. We could see it in his pregame comments to us, the focus, the energy, the enthusiasm. He was not to be denied today. His mission, one more game, and then it's complete. All right, so it will be game number four for that one more game here on Wednesday night. If the Bulls are able to win it, the Sonics will try to stay alive and uh, hope to uh, force it to a fifth game uh, back here on Friday night. That's it for the game portion of our telecast. Marv Albert with Matt Kukas and Bill Walton. Now let's uh, throw it to Bob Costas upstairs. Bob? Okay, Marv, thanks a lot. I guess now we can begin calling them 
the inevitables up 3-0. It's only a matter of when they close it out. They have two shots at doing it here in Seattle. Uh, if Seattle can win two, obviously they would force a sixth game back in Chicago. That doesn't appear likely at this point. So it appears that if Chicago wins their fourth championship, they will do it for the third time out of those four titles on the road. Only once against Portland in 1992 did they finish it on their home floor. They have a mission on Wednesday, not just to win the championship, but to complete the sweep and stake another claim to greatness. The only team that went through the entire playoffs, losing only one game, was Dr. J's 1983 Philadelphia 76ers. They didn't play in the first round, so they were 12 and 1. Chicago could finish at 15 and 1 if they sweep it. Now, don't forget that coming right up, our NBA Finals postgame special on CNBC. More interviews and analysis in the aftermath of Chicago's devastating win this evening. And on Wednesday night, we have Game 4 of the Finals back here at Key Arena in Seattle. Now, coming up next on NBC, a special postgame episode, it says here, of Mad About You. Will Paul Reiser and Helen Hunt be in the locker rooms? Tune in and find out. For our entire crew in Seattle, I'm Bob Costas. Good night on the NBC side. See you in a few moments if you're so inclined on CNBC. So long. We now join NBC Sports. This is the 1996 NBA Finals Post Game Show. Now your host, Bob Costas. So the Chicago Bulls are up three games to none, 108-86 over the Sonics here at Key Arena in game three. Michael Jordan got 27 of his 36 in the first half. The Sonics made a run late in the second quarter and in the third quarter to get close, but they could never get it inside double digits, and eventually the Bulls prevail, 108 to 86. Bob Costas back upstairs here with Peter Bessie and Julia Serving. Well, what can you say? The first couple of games, the Bulls were able to win, but tonight they just about unveiled the full arsenal. I, I think, Bob, that they finally showed who they really are. You know, I was thinking before this game, well, what did Seattle learn in the first two games? Uh, do they need to trap a little bit more? In Chicago, they trapped once. Once the press was broken, you know, they just retreated to guard the basket. When they came home to Seattle, would they trap multiple times, a second time, a third time, as they did so often during the season? Uh, the Bulls had all that go right out the window because Seattle was cold in the beginning. The Bulls were determined to try to win this game in the first 10 minutes, and I think that's exactly when they won it. Peter. I think it's last year's Magic Rockets series all over again. The team that hasn't been there doesn't know, understand what it takes to get the job done. Uh, the Sonics now learning uh, that every possession is meaningful, the fever pitch that it takes, the demonic defense, the, pre the precision, the execution, all these things they'll remember if they ever get back here again. Folks, if you watch the broadcast on NBC, and I assume if you're interested enough to watch a post-game show on CNBC, you probably watch the game itself on NBC. Then you saw plenty with Dennis Rodman. He got the pregame. He got the halftime. Let's give him the hat trick. Here he is on the post-game with Jim Gray. Thank you very much, Bob Costas. Well, Dennis Rodman, you now go up three games to none. What will go on now in the next 72 hours? It's going to be difficult to concentrate. You're just right there on the edge. I'm going to watch a lot of game tapes. I'm going to watch a lot of game tapes until the, the day comes. I'm just, I'm just ready to go. I'm focused. I'm ready to go. I want to get in this, in this now. How different does this feel than the two that you won with the Detroit Pistons? It feels, it feels a lot different because I didn't really appreciate what it, what it means to be, to be appreciated as, as a world champion. Now, it's totally different. Now, I know what's going on. I know what it means. And now, let's go out there and do it. Last year, it seems as though with San Antonio, 
you were a dislikable figure. It seems as though certainly Chicago has taken to you and now the rest of the country. Have you done something consciously to try and earn the respect of everyone? I haven't done anything. I've just been myself, individual. I, I, I can't be like all the rest of these people here and try to be something that I'm not. And, uh, you know, if what you see is what you get. If you don't like it, that's, that's, your, that's your tough luck. But uh, I'm just trying to go out there and play for the people, make people happy. That's it. What were you saying to all of the Sonics? You had a, almost a verbal confrontation with everybody on the team, particularly Burkowski. I love that. I, lo I love getting people head and uh, Charles Carr tried to get in my head. He's a great coach, but he got to understand something. He don't have the guys on the bench that's mentally tough enough to handle what I got to say and do out there. So you better prepare yourself and study for the next 72 hours. Even Michael gave you a hug. We haven't seen Michael have physical contact with you since you guys won 70 games. What did he say when he put his arm around you? You know, he said no one really appreciates what you really bring to this game. And basically that's all he says. You know, he said, you know, I'm glad to, glad to have him on the team and I'm, so, I'm glad to be here. Dennis, thanks for taking the time with us. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Back to you, Bob Costas. All right, Jim, thanks a lot. Well, all of us must respect the play of Dennis Rodman on the court, but now I learn that he is something of a Henry David Thoreau figure of the late 20th century in terms of being an icon of individualism, and we're all heartened to learn that. But your thoughts on his play tonight? Well, <laughs> my thoughts, period, you know, I don't think the things he does off the court has necessarily any positive social redeeming value, but on the court, he is a force to be reckoned with, and uh, you see the confidence exuding from him now. I don't think that all the Bulls are going to walk around with their chest out you know thinking that it's done even though history history says something different I think they're still going to maintain their modesty and uh, try and respect the Sonics as they've respected every team in the league while they're beating on them. We're going to hear from Nate McMillan who spoke with Hannah Storm a moment ago but before we do a quick thought here from you. Well the Bulls got bumped last year by Orlando uh, the difference between last year and this year with the Bulls being one victory away from a championship is the fact that Michael Jordan came back in shape had a conditioning program in training camp and Dennis Rodman he can't be outworked he is the presence that they lacked last year on the boards and defensively. Well, the view from the bench couldn't have been pretty from the perspective of Nate McMillan, who was sidelined by injury and watched in street clothes, and immediately after the game, he spoke with our Hannah Storm. Here it is. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Nate, it seemed as if this game was won from the very beginning by the Chicago Bulls. What happened in the first half that enabled them to get out to that huge run? Well, I think they just came out and uh, played very aggressive. Uh, this team is a very experienced team, and they wanted to make a statement early in the game. And Michael and those guys came off to a, got off to a very aggressive start. Uh, start. They started Kukos, which uh, sort of threw us a curve at the beginning of the game and gave them more offensive power. And uh, they just got off to a good start. They shot the ball well. The defense was there. And um, our shots wasn't falling early in the game. You've just come out of the locker room. What was said after the game? Well, the thing is, we have to continue to believe. I think uh, it, it seems to me that we're giving these guys too much respect. It's sort of difficult to, to get upset or uh, go out with an attitude against Michael and Scotty and those guys because they're not physical or dirty players. But we, I think we're giving them a little bit too much respect. You know, we're, we're not bumping and grinding. We're a physical team, and right now we don't have that into our game. And they're out there executing and um, just picking us apart. They've done a tremendous job also when you look back on the three games neutralizing Gary Payton. How much of that has to do with you being unable to play how much of that has to do with their defense well I think I think it's me uh, all together you know with me in the lineup Gary is free to roam get up and down the floor I'm able to run the point uh, get the ball to him so he can get out into the early early offense and um, just create create his shots but right now with me out of the game uh, he has to handle the ball uh, the whole game, and that's taken away from his game. Uh, the steals are not there. I looked up. We only had three steals, so um, I help in that, in that way, too. But, uh, you know, we got to find a way to get our transition going, and right now we don't. We don't. No team has ever come back from a 3 of deficit at this point. Is there any realistic hope of your doing that, or are you just looking to game four and, and the pride of this franchise? Well, it's always hope. You know, we still have a game to go. We have two games left here. Uh, the thing is, we have to win. We have to win now. You know, uh, that's what it comes down to. We have to win the next game. If we win that one, uh, we have another game in Seattle. But uh, we have to play much more aggressive basketball than we played in the last three games. Okay, Nate McMillan, thanks so much for joining us. And now you wish you could be out there in uniform to help your team out. Yeah. All right, thanks. Bob? Okay, Hannah, I guess one way to describe this series for the Sonics, McMillan and Strife.
<laughs> Susan St. James, we should, we should get a bonus for doing something like that. <laughs> there you go. You get the feeling, though, that although Nate is an important contributor and he would have changed their substitutions and whatnot, that it really doesn't make that much difference. Well, With I, all due respect. Well, I think it made a huge difference in the first two games because people are get, beginning to understand and appreciate what Nate, Nate McMillan means to this team. I mean, he mentioned a number of things there. What he didn't mention was the leadership and the three-pointers. And without him coming off the bench, Sam Perkins basically is a starter with Irvin Johnson getting only a few minutes. The Sonics don't have a bench. Yeah, let me clarify. I meant tonight. Obviously, the first two games were close and could have turned on any number of things. Well, yeah, I think it made a, an absolute difference. Uh, you know, in, in game two, he could have made the difference because it was a close game. The first two uh, were blowouts. But if you look at the Chicago situation when they were missing Tony Kukoc, it put so much pressure on Scottie Pippen to handle the ball and do 80 percent of the playmaking instead of sharing that responsibility with Tony and with Michael that his offensive game suffered and the Bulls ended up losing that one game to the next. All right, we're going to take a break here. And when we come back on the postgame show, we'll hear from George Carl, from Phil Jackson, from Steve Kerr, and from Spike Lee here in Seattle, where the Sonics could not do the right thing tonight. We'll be back. Back in Seattle, where the Bulls blew out the Sonics, took a 3-0 lead in the series. As you know, Dennis Rodman removes his jersey after each game. And who got it tonight or this late afternoon in Seattle? Let's take a look. Do we have that footage? Cindy Crawford was in attendance at the game. And there she is, the lucky winner of the souvenir or recipient of the souvenir. Dennis Rodman's road jersey belongs to Cindy Crawford after the game three victory and now we go to Steve Kerr and his post game thoughts. All right. Thank you very much Bob. I'm joined by Steve Kerr. Steve you just came out of the locker room. What's the feeling back there. Just one game away from this historic run. Well we're pretty happy but we're we're trying not to be too happy because we still haven't finished it off. Uh, we have one more to go obviously and it'll be nice to relax for a couple days and then get back at it. Will these next three days drive you crazy or with the anticipation? Is it going to be a long time coming for this game? It'd be a lot longer if we were only up 2 one. I'll tell you that uh, we would like to play Tuesday, you know, but but you know schedule says Wednesday and why not enjoy a few days in Seattle. Did you expect more of a fight tonight from Seattle. I mean you guys came out in the first 10 minutes and, and effectively this game was over. Well we actually felt like we're, we were due to play a good game and that's kind of the scary thing about our team is we can win when we're not playing well but offensively we really haven't played well uh, in the playoffs that often. So we were due and, and when Michael came out on fire like that and all of a sudden Luke's scoring and and Tony starts uh, surprisingly and, and, and hits like his first three shots I think you know that's uh, that was a good sign right there It was gonna be a long night for them. As has been his custom, was it a mistake of Gary Payton to make such a to-do and get in Michael's face? I wouldn't advise getting in Michael's face to anybody. It was probably a mistake, but that's Gary's game, and, and you know he's he's going to play that way, and that's what usually gets him going. So you know you can't blame him for that. Steve, it seemed as though tonight as well that you guys kind of played off the theatrics of Dennis Rodman, his taunting, if you want to call it that, and his enthusiasm. Was that the case? Well we always feed off of Dennis's energy. That's one of his uh, keys to, to the team really. He, he brings defense and rebounding but also a lot of energy and uh, he, he withstood uh, some some psychological warfare out there from the Sonics too and we thought he did a good job of holding up. Steve thanks for joining us. Right, thanks Jim. All right back to you Bob. Jim thanks a lot. Do not go anywhere. We're coming right back to you. Steve Kerr was just one for 11 in the first two games in Chicago uncharacteristically off in terms of his shooting and tonight he comes through with three of four and a total of eight points. So that was Steve Kerr on tape with Jim Gray moments ago. Now we go back down to the floor and here he is live with Luke Longley. Jim. All right. Thank you very much Bob. Luke Longley 19 points tonight his play playoff career high. In fact you had your career high back in November 21 points. What's with you in this building seems to bring out the best of you. I don't know it does. It's been good to me this year. I, you know I'd <clears throat> like to come back even more often. Michael got after you pretty good in game two. Tonight you come out much more aggressively with much more of an offensive impact. What was it that he said that got you going and, and why the production tonight. Well it wasn't so much what Michael said that got me going. It was just I was, I was disappointed with game two. I had a very good game one offensively and uh, just sort of uh, didn't really get it and never got into game two. And uh, obviously having Michael spurring you on helps. But you know it was something that would have happened I think otherwise. It looks like you've been playing a little Australian rules football. Did the stitches the other night make you mad. 
Certainly, and uh, that was one of the things that Michael mentioned was that you know I still had a fairly poor game after receiving a cut like that. He thinks that that should fire me up, so uh, I did, and I, and I played I played a lot better tonight. You were much more physical tonight as well. You kind of pushed John Kemp at one point. Uh, was it your intent just to get after it a little bit more tonight? Yeah, I tried to concentrate a lot harder on, on Sean and on, on getting sort of underneath him early in transition, not letting him get those easy baskets. And I think uh, you know it frustrated him, especially in the first half. Is there a celebration going on in there, or is it still a bit premature? No, this team's very good at, at, at not uh, having premature celebrations. Um, <laughs> We, we didn't just celebrate our Eastern Conference win, but I think we'll have a good one once we uh, once we win the whole thing, and hopefully that'll be fairly shortly. Wednesday night. I hope so. I mean, I think this Seattle team's got a, got a lot of fight left in them, so, you know, you, you never can tell. All right, Luke, we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks a lot, mate. Good on you. All right. Back to you, mate, Bob. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jim, and to you, Luke. Good day. Now let's go to the interview room where Phil Jackson moments ago had these comments for the assembled members of the press. Here's the Bulls coach. Seattle can play as hard as they did in the third quarter, make things difficult for us. <coughs> and uh, we've got a road ahead of us to go before we can uh, claim this one. Phil, it, it seemed as if uh, in game one and two, you single covered Kemp the way you did O'Neill and Ewing and Morning before that. And in this game, it seemed like you threw a lot more double teams then, and there was a conscious effort to stop him in this game, because he's the only one that really hurt you in the first two. I couldn't see you because of that sport coat in front of you. Is it? <laughs> the, um, Sorry, Phil. The uh, strategy today was to throw double teams at Sean. He had really hurt us badly in the two games in Chicago. We thought that perhaps he would be even better here in the home court, and we tried to get the ball out of his hands early in the game. And it worked simply because they did miss a couple open threes and led us to runouts. We had a couple steals. And I thought he didn't get the kind of sh looks or shots that he necessarily likes or get involved in the game the way he likes to do it. Okay. Do you think that there are teams in this league right now that have any type of mental capacity in these playoffs to understand what playoff basketball is about? And do you think that with Jordan and Pippen and Rodman, you really have a monopoly on that? in this league at this time? You know, that's a grandiose question to answer, and I'd hate to be a pompous ass by answering it and saying that, no, there is no other team. But the thing that's impressive, I think most impressive to a coach like myself about the team that I've been able to coach this year is the fact that they go on the road and they're a better basketball club on the road. For some reason or another, the resiliency of this basketball club steps up and that is the true mark of a championship team. And I'll say it, it's happened before. I've seen it happen when the Pistons were a championship team, the Bulls were a championship team in the 90s. And they seem to have a chemical bond that really strengthens their unit. Phil, you've done a real good job of dealing with uh, Dennis's uh, performance over the year. And you guys were in such control of the game. Why didn't you let it get stupid at the end? Well, you know, I, I felt that uh, you know, Bukowski come out in the third quarter and accomplished what he brings to the game, a very physical, kind of intense scrum activity out there. And Dennis stayed pretty strong without, uh, throughout that period. But there was a few things that were just too many confrontations. I didn't like what was going on. And I didn't want the game to disintegrate. I don't think it's uh, you know, fair to, to the game itself to let it disintegrate that way. And uh, Dennis had a little trouble holding his head today, but I thought he did a real good job overall. Luckily, uh, we had switched from the broadcast to the cable side before Phil Jackson made uh, reference to the possibility of appearing to be a pompous posterior or words to that effect. Perhaps Phil aware that he was uh, on the more liberal airwaves of CNBC than NBC. But you have words of praise that will play on any broadcast outlet for him, right? Question? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, though, talking about Phil Jackson, he's so far ahead of everybody. The way he and his staff are adjusting. While I take it back,
back. They set the co set the mode, and then everyone has to adjust. And while the Sonics are trying to adjust to Gary Payton being defense, he switches it, and defense is Sean Kemp. So his staff and uh, Phil deserve a lot of credit. So you don't buy the idea that just because you have the best horses, you can't be the best coaches. Not anybody would have won 72 games. Not just anybody with this you've team. Got to, you've got to be very prepared, and this staff is very prepared. Best in the league. Okay, we're prepared with more interviews. We'll hear from Spike Lee and George Carl, among others, when we come back. So the Bulls win it 108 to 86, and they can finish the job if they have sweep on their mind on Wednesday back here at Key Arena. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from tonight's Game 3 here in Seattle. Pick it up from the start. Ron Harper, normally a starter, with a sore knee. Tony Kukoc opens instead. No matter, Chicago gets off quickly. Michael connecting for three of his 12 in the first quarter. Bulls score the first seven of the game. Kukoc coming off strong back-to-back -back games in Chicago. Hits the tray here. Chicago up 18 to four. The Sonics committed 13 turnovers in the first half compared to just five for the Bulls, and it cost them. Scotty Pippen will take it the length of the floor here. Chicago by 18 after one quarter. On to the second period, and the Sonics go on an 11-0 run. Gary Payton cutting Chicago's lead to 34-23, but that was as close as they got in the first half. George Carl's team on its way to three straight losses for the first time all year. Luke Longley with a nice move here, and the hook pulls back up by 16. Longley had 19 points. All Jordan in the first half. The NBA's MVP and scoring champion scored 15 straight in one stretch for Chicago. By halftime, he had 27 points on 8 of 16 shooting from the field. Moving to the fourth quarter after we get done with Jordan's exploits. And there's Dennis Rodman playing some mind games with his good friend, Frank Burkowski. And moments later, Burkowski and Rodman become entangled. Burkowski called for the flagrant foul, and he is ejected for the second time. In three games, the Bulls take game three. A laugher for Michael Jordan and company who can barely conceal their amusement, winning by a score of 108 to 86. And now, as promised, a conversation with Spike Lee. Let's have our producer, Rick Diamond, tell me who spoke with him. Jim, naturally Jim Gray. Jim Gray Very speaks with everybody. There he is. joined by Spike Lee. Spike, we know that you're a big New York Knicks fan, but you're also very close to Michael Jordan. Sitting in these stands, you travel all over. What is your thought process, and how do you feel about just watching these games when one of your best friends playing, and he's on the verge now of making history, coming back after a couple years off? I feel good for, for Mike, but I'm disappointed in Seattle. They didn't show nothing tonight. Nothing. No, no fight, really, did they? They didn't come out with much, much energy or much anticipation of getting back in this series, did they? I thought they were going to show me more than that, man, but it's over now. They're coming out for blood Wednesday night. So I just watched it on television because it's, it's done deal. What did you expect when, they, when the uh, Sonics come out tonight? Uh, I know you talked to several of the players. Did you expect that they would be able to get back into this series? Or, or knowing Michael as you knew him you know, and know him, did you, did you feel that it wouldn't be much of an effort? I thought Chicago was a win, but I thought Seattle would give him a fight. But he just rolled over tonight. I don't know what happened. Spike, you've seen a lot of teams. You've been a basketball fan for an awful long time. How does this Chicago team compare to the other teams you've seen along the line? They're all right. <laughs> just all right. You're not going to give it better than nah, your next nah, team? No, nah, no, nah. They're a great team. They're a great team. It, it's just amazing to me. I think that, you know, people are dogging the Knicks out. Well, they play Chicago hard any team in the playoffs, you know. And if it wasn't with Bill Oaks, they could have won game four. Oh, you're not going to blame the referee for this, well, the are guy you? called two travels with a minute in the last second, last minute of the game. You're saying without that, the Knicks would be here right now? No, I'm saying <laughs> we would have been, we'd have won two games instead of one. But still, I mean, like, you got to be physical with Chicago. I mean, other than that, man, they're going to kill you. Are you going to spend your whole life just hoping that somebody can beat Chicago? Hey, we get Barkley next year. We're gonna <laughs> we got to be, I want to be Mike before he retires. Well, there's been a lot of talk. Do you feel as though Charles Barkley or Jawan Howard, or, or what is the somebody. answer coming into New York? We're getting somebody. Reggie Miller, Allen Houston, <laughs> Barkley, or Jawan. We're getting somebody. And I'm going to be ready next year. Were you happy with the decision to keep Jeff Van Gundy? Yes, I'm glad he's they signed him. Don Nelson, that was, a, that was the wrong move. Wrong move. And you know, on top of that, probably gonna, they're still going to raise the ticket prices next year to the 1250 Hey, that's a lot of money for a game. That's, what's that, 3000 a game. Somehow I don't think you'll be canceling. 
now because there are people waiting for my seats. I'm going to keep on trying. Maybe you'll be able to cancel a little penny seat. That may be a little too much to pay. All right. <laughs> Spike, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Good Thank luck to you, you with your filmmaking. Thanks. All right, let's go back to Bob Costas. All right, Jim Spike Lee, a very knowledgeable and passionate basketball fan, offering a harsh critique of the NBA referees of the Sonics play tonight and some free advice to Dave Checkets and Ernie Grunfeld about the decisions coming up in the offseason for the Knicks. But, of course, he's concerned about the ever-escalating price of courtside seats at the Garden. I understand they may even make Marv pay to get in next year. Let's go to him. And Bob, I can certainly understand that uh, also. Uh, Spike lashing out in many <laughs> directions. Uh, getting back to what took place. Uh, here tonight and in the series of course on Wednesday the Chicago Bulls could make it a four game sweep let's take a look back at uh, what has taken place over the uh, first three the Bulls taking the first two in the Windy City as Tony Kukoc led an impressive fourth quarter charge by Chicago in a 17 point opening game victory uh, Kukoc on fire and then in game two was Dennis Rodman controlling the boards 11 offensive rebounds to tie a finals record tonight Michael Jordan off to the quick start and uh, Jordan came out did it in the first quarter as uh, the Bulls were able to blister the Sonics uh, in the opening quarter and he finished with a game high of 36 points Michael showing the entire arsenal finished strong and then enjoyed watching the final minutes uh, at the bench as Phil Jackson was able to uh, shuffle things down the stretch a look at uh, Michael's performance not happy with what took place in games one and two they were not Jordan like lofty numbers but 28 and 29 not bad and then 36 here uh, tonight the Bulls 50 percent shooting the Sonics uh, 45 but did not pick that up until late in the game in the assist department again the Sonics uh, falling short had only 10 in game two 14 uh, here tonight in game three and look at 21 uh, turnovers and once again Seattle not able to do it uh, from downtown only four of 16 from three-point range Matt what is going on with Seattle's offense well I talked to George Carl before the season started and he told me that what he, what he was most concerned about their offense and now I see why it has just been terrible during the regular season they rely so much on getting some easy baskets from their defense well you don't just don't do that against a team like Chicago because they take care of the ball and their transition defense is good but in the half court Seattle is just not disciplined enough not crisp enough and they just don't seem to have a plan all right now the Bulls get through the long layoff concern for game one the concern of overconfidence for game number two and uh, for game number three what is uh, Phil Jackson going to come up with a theme in game number four Mar for Phil Jackson and the Chicago Bulls it's all about the challenge of being perfect that's what Phil Jackson has meant to this bull franchise since he took over he's got them to this threshold now they've got a chance to make NBA history look for them to come out on fire all right let's go back upstairs to Bob up 3-0 in a series you've never been down 0-3 what, what are your thoughts on what's going through the heads of the Bulls the Sonics been down three but not 0-3 and uh, gone for the closer a couple of times in, in the ABA and the series against uh, Los Angeles in uh, 1983 uh, we won the third game in LA we had two or three days before it was time to play and let me tell you the game can't come fast enough you get so antsy you want to go out to playgrounds and play against kids just to keep your game sharp and then the day comes and if you're a good player you know that no matter how far you're down you're going to win that game because history is on your side okay they've got to wait about seven 72 hours or so, but they can go for the sweep on Wednesday for Peter Vesey and for Dr. J and our whole crew. A reminder that Game 4 of the NBA Finals, the Bulls and Sonics from Seattle, will be Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern Time as the Bulls try to complete the winningest season in NBA history with a sweep of the Sonics. For our entire NBC crew, Bob Costas, so long from Seattle.